I know it's hard to believe something if you've never personally experienced the supernatural. Living here in the Southwest, I grew up with stories like these. Trust me, sometimes I don't even know what to believe, but I believe the things my eyes see. I believe the way my heart feels. And I most definitely believe in what happened to me on that highway some years ago. I was working an hour away from my home at the time. During the summers, it wasn't too bad. I'd get home before sunset. But when the seasons changed, it's like I never saw the sunlight in my home. I was gone before the sun rose and back after sunfall. Sometimes I felt like I was living in Alaska. My mom would laugh and say, a desert is a long way from Alaska, but it still felt similar to me. I would travel across one state to another every day. I lived pretty close, basically next door. I suppose it was a good conversation starter. Really, it didn't change too much, going from one state to another. But I'd find ways to make it sound more interesting than it was. And then it happened. Something unusual. Something unexplainable. Something that my mind couldn't figure out. I was driving home. It was one of those days where you just really wanted to enjoy it and make the best of things. I was in a good mood. And so I decided that I wanted to take my time getting home. It was getting dark at this point, but the sun hadn't set all the way. I'm driving along pleasantly when I see something dart out in front of my car. To me, it looked like some type of wolf or coyote or something, but it was massive, whatever it was, and it startled me. So I stomped on my brakes. Luckily, this highway was never occupied by anyone other than me, ever. But whatever it was, I did hit it a little. I was scared. I wish someone else was there to help me. But I was on my own. I didn't experience any injuries myself. I stopped in time before anything devastating happened. But I did slide into it, like I said. I knew I had to make sure that what I saw was for sure an animal and not a person. And that it was all right, that I didn't injure it in a major way. I'm nervous, very nervous. I'm sitting in the middle of the highway and I'm looking towards the side of the interstate to see if I can identify the thing. Honestly, I started wondering if the mass was a person at that point because it seemed like it was walking on its hind legs, but that wouldn't really make sense. So I basically couldn't identify it with positivity. I wasn't entirely sure what to do. It sounds like a very stupid situation, but it was incredibly worrisome. So I tried calling out to it. I shout, are you okay? I didn't get a response. It seems silly to be asking a strange mass if it's okay. I know this. As I'm watching the mass walk further away from my car and into the desert, it looks to be standing more upright. Now it could have been the position I was in, but that's how it looked. And then it vanishes completely. In a way, I'm sort of relieved, but a part of me still feels a tremendous amount of guilt. So I got out of my car. My first instinct is to look at the front of my car to see if there's a lot of damage. My hope was that this would tell me if I heard it, whatever it was. I didn't see any blood, but I did see a bit of a crack in my bumper and some hair that might have been tugged out when it pulled away. The hair was dark and coarse, but it was surprisingly long. It seemed too long to belong to a wolf. But again, a human out here running across a highway doesn't sound very believable either. I looked along the ground to see if there was any blood on the road. It didn't appear so. So I'm wondering if I'm safe to drive away. But this thing keeps nagging at me. I felt so guilty that I just had to be 100% sure that it wasn't a person. I wanted to see if I could find some track marks to get a concrete answer to this whole mess. It's dark at this point, but I always keep a flashlight in my car. Driving on the highway at night without a flashlight would be very dumb. This scenario proves it. Anyways, I get my flashlight. And I walk to the side of the road closest to me, which happens to be the side the thing started on. Unfortunately, the tracks on that side of the road weren't really identifiable. The thing was running so fast. Perhaps this is why I couldn't tell what left them. So I moved to the other side of the highway. Let me make this as brief as I can. 
What I saw didn't make sense. Just like the mass I saw when I hit it didn't make sense, or the shadow walking away from me didn't make sense. Basically, I saw tracks. But the tracks didn't appear to come from one thing. It seemed like the tracks started out like a wolf or coyote, but then they started to shift into something that looked human. I know how this sounds. It sounds unreal. But that's the only way I can describe what I saw. Eventually, I am so freaked out that I decide I'm not equipped to handle this situation. I might have hit someone, and the responsibility was on me to call and report the incident. So I did. The deputies didn't know what to tell me other than it must have been an animal because they didn't find any trace of a human being out on the side of the highway. But what I saw, and the different things that I saw, seemed to suggest otherwise. I've lived in New Mexico my whole life. We see strange things on a daily basis. It isn't unusual for us, I guess. If you're a New Mexico native, you grow up hearing all sorts of bizarre stories. But these stories are real to those who have experienced them. They aren't stories that have been made up. And on top of that, New Mexico has a lot of underlying superstition. It's as if the place was made of it. If you talk to any of the Apaches or Navajos, or just anyone who has had long family ties to the state, they'll all tell you a similar story. You can ask them about the lights in the sky, and they'll all usually just nod their heads. They've known about the lights, they've seen the lights, and they've all just accepted them as part of the world. I guess I'm more of a skeptic. Yes, I know of a lot of unusual happenings, but I'm also a firm believer in science and facts. So when I moved into the house across from a New Mexico Air Force base, I guess I didn't realize the activity that I'd be exposing myself and my children to. We had lived in my home for a few years before anything really started to happen. Of course, we'd see different aircraft leave at night, but usually only during the night. But one late night sometime in June, we started hearing unusual noises coming from the base. They were loud, so loud, they woke up the whole household. Really, they reminded me of a type of doomsday siren you'd hear in a movie. At first, I was scared because I wasn't sure if it was some type of siren to get us to evacuate. But when I noticed all of my surrounding neighbors were out on their porches pointing towards the sky, I realized it was something more bizarre. In the sky were strange orbs. They didn't move like a plane or helicopter. They actually seemed to weave and dance with each other. It was very weird. But soon the orbs vanished. It lasted maybe two minutes, and the noise stopped too. I see all my neighbors going inside. None of them are really talking to each other, and I didn't know any of them well enough to start a conversation about what had happened, so we went inside too. The next morning I had a terribly painful headache. So did my family. I called into work because I couldn't even function. The lights hurt my eyes, and so did sounds. A few weeks passed and we heard the noise again, but this time it sounded like a low hum. I peeked out my window. The neighbors were all inside, it seemed. So I looked up at the sky and I could see those orbs again, but they seemed further away. That next morning, I had another headache. It was painful, but not nearly as bad as the time prior. Weeks would pass in between the events, but we all started to get used to it. Even the headaches became a normal part of our lives. But just as we started to get used to these things, we started to experience other stuff. One night we had heard the noise, and one of my kids came into my room complaining about a weird tapping noise coming from the backyard. I told them that I would check outside if they promised that they'd go to sleep right after. They agreed. So I went to the back door, and I opened it. I looked around the porch, but I didn't see anything unusual. So I went back inside and instructed them to go back to sleep. The next day, I wasn't feeling well. Yes, I had a headache, but I also was just very fatigued and weak. I thought I might be getting a cold, so I stayed home. I was going around the house picking things up. My kids had left a bunch of toys in our living room, so I went into their room to put it all away. Obviously, their room wasn't in any better condition, so I started grabbing dirty socks and clothes up from the floor, and I opened their curtains to let some light in. 
As soon as I pulled the curtains open, I noticed that there was a shape of a hand on the window. We get a lot of sandstorms, so the handprint looked like it was left on the outside of the window, almost completely absent of dirt, as if this hand wiped it all away. To be sure, I wiped the glass with my finger. The handprint was definitely on the outside. The thing that really bothered me about the handprint was that the palm was very tiny, but the fingers seemed long and thin. I thought maybe my kids had been in the backyard, and they wanted to scare me by creating a strange handprint on the window. I guess I didn't let it bother me much, but I went ahead and looked outside again. I walked over to their window and I could see the handprint. And underneath the handprint, I saw more handprints all along the windowsill, and below that I saw what looked like two feet imprinted in the dirt. It was clear that someone was standing at the window, and the feet were small, like my kids, but the shape did not appear to be normal. I will be honest, the dirt seemed to have been disturbed. The footprints weren't very clear, but they looked more like handprints than footprints. The sole seemed longer than that of a palm, but the toes were very long. Just like the handprint on the window. Who knows, maybe they were just more handprints. But the placement of everything seemed a bit too elaborate for my kids. That's when I started to feel a little uncomfortable. Seeing the bizarre traces of someone, something outside of my kids' room, didn't make me feel very good about the stories I had heard growing up, even if I was a skeptic. We still experience strange things to this day. Even the strange handprints left after nights of odd activities at the Air Force Base. I needed a job over the summer before school started in the fall. My parents insisted. They said it would build character. And at least I'd have my own money. My dad knew a guy who owned a recycling plant, and they needed a security person during the night. When I met him, he told me it wasn't really security, they just called it that, so it sounded more professional. It's easy, just try not to fall asleep, he told me. On my first shift, I stood there and watched the last members of the crew toss their helmets down and head out to their cars. I didn't really know what to do or what to expect. I locked the gate after they were gone and walked around the perimeter. Seemed like the thing to do. The place was big. I heard some humming machines and a drip of grease or water and stuff. Overall, not much was going on. I was nearly bored out of my mind by the time I did my first walk around the place. I decided I had nothing better to do than go around again. I tried to tell myself it was good exercise. This time around, I noticed a bunch of steel bars were scattered all over the ground in an area. I tried to remember if I had heard anything and I'm sure that I didn't. I took out the flashlight they gave me and walked over to check it out. That was my job. At first the pipes looked like they had just fallen. I thought maybe the shelf they lived on had broken or something like that. I checked around to see if anything was wrong but I couldn't tell at all. It just looked like whatever a recycling plant was supposed to look like, I guess. There was something weird about the pipes. I leaned down close and noticed a film or slime of some kind, and they were all scratched up. There were even big gauges taken out. It reminded me of bear claws for some reason. Suddenly I got that feeling like I was being watched. If you have ever felt like that, then you know what I mean. I looked around and pointed my little flashlight, but I didn't see anything. I felt spooked but told myself it was just from the job. I was alone in a big plant. I walked back to the office. When I noticed the door was slightly open, just an inch or two, but I was sure I had closed it. I stood there a minute and waited, but I don't know for what. Before I moved, the door burst open. I mean burst. The top hinges broke off. Something huge came running out on two legs. It happened so fast I don't think I moved. The thing flew past me, and all I could make out was it looked like somebody in a big, realistic lizard costume, which seemed insane, and I was scared out of my mind. I dropped the flashlight onto the floor. I stared at the smashed door frame in disbelief. I heard horrible scraping noises from somewhere behind me, like the worst nails on a chalkboard. 
I thought I was going to go deaf, but I screamed instead. I ran to the door to hide in the office, and the door just fell. It was smashed worse than I thought. Whatever that thing was, it was making noises in the dark. I could hear clanging and smashing. Now I knew what had knocked the pipes down and gashed them. I needed a job over the summer before school started in the fall. My parents insisted. They said it would build character, and at least I'd have my own money. My dad knew a guy who owned a recycling plant, and they needed a security person during the night. When I met him, he told me it wasn't really security, they just called it that, so it sounded more professional. It's easy, just try not to fall asleep, he told me. On my first shift, I stood there and watched the last members of the crew toss their helmets down and head out to their cars. I didn't really know what to do or what to expect. I locked the gate after they were gone and walked around the perimeter. Seemed like the thing to do. The place was big. I heard some humming machines and a drip of grease or water and stuff. Overall, not much was going on. I was nearly bored out of my mind by the time I did my first walk around the place. I decided I had nothing better to do than go around again. I tried to tell myself it was good exercise. This time around, I noticed a bunch of steel bars were scattered all over the ground in an area. I tried to remember if I had heard anything and I'm sure that I didn't. I took out the flashlight they gave me and walked over to check it out. That was my job. At first, the pipes looked like they had just fallen. I thought maybe the shelf they lived on had broken or something like that. I checked around to see if anything was wrong, but I couldn't tell at all. It just looked like whatever a recycling plant was supposed to look like, I guess. There was something weird about the pipes. I leaned down close and noticed a film or slime of some kind, and they were all scratched up. There were even big gauges taken out. It reminded me of bear claws for some reason. Suddenly, I got that feeling like I was being watched. If you have ever felt like that, then you know what I mean. I looked around and pointed my little flashlight, but I didn't see anything. I felt spooked, but told myself it was just from the job. I was alone in a big plant. I walked back to the office. When I noticed the door was slightly open, just an inch or two, but I was sure I had closed it. I stood there a minute and waited, but I don't know for what. Before I moved, the door burst open. I mean burst. The top hinges broke off. Something huge came running out on two legs. It happened so fast I don't think I moved. The thing flew past me, and all I could make out was it looked like somebody in a big, realistic lizard costume, which seemed insane, and I was scared out of my mind. I dropped the flashlight onto the floor. I stared at the smashed door frame in disbelief. I heard horrible scraping noises from somewhere behind me, like the worst nails on a chalkboard. I thought I was going to go deaf, but I screamed instead. I ran to the door to hide in the office, and the door just fell. It was smashed worse than I thought. Whatever that thing was, it was making noises in the dark. I could hear clanging and smashing. Now I knew what had knocked the pipes down and gashed them. I've never told anyone about this. I live in the desert in the southwest, so there's not a lot of forests and hiking trails. Stuff like that. We don't get snow or much rain. So I was excited to visit my sister and her new husband, Todd, for Christmas. They had recently moved to Massachusetts, where he was from. I knew it snowed there. That was about it. It definitely snows in Massachusetts. The snow was like a foot deep the day I arrived. It was freezing. But it was great to see my sister. Her new husband is pretty cool, and we get along well. So the day after Christmas, it was snowing like crazy. Todd told me about a cool hiking trail behind their house. He said there's a nice view of the town when it's all covered in snow. I was getting dressed for the hike when he came in and told me he had just gotten called in to work. He's in IT, and I guess there was some sort of problem with the systems. He said he wasn't going to be able to go with me and felt horrible. He then handed me a piece of paper. He drew a crude map of the area. It's easy, he told me. He pointed out the basics on the map, pointing out all the good places to stop and check things out. And then he headed out. 
the house was quiet. My sister was already at work. I was still dressed for a hike, probably too bundled, but like I said, I'm from the desert. I'm not a snow person. I looked out the window and it was a total whiteout which looked pretty cool, so I decided to go ahead and check it out by myself. I walked around the house to the backyard. I stepped over the low wire fence and went down the hill toward the woods. Todd definitely wasn't a liar. It was beautiful. The snow made it totally silent, and everything was obviously white. The woods were much darker, though, with the cover of the trees. After walking through bright white, it took a moment to adjust to the darkness, and I felt more closed in. I heard the crackling of the snow in the sunshine and pulled my gloves off. For some reason, it was hot inside the woods. That seemed weird to me. After only a few steps into the woods, I was hit by a smell of garbage. Not a nature-type smell. I smelled like spoiled meat. I thought that maybe a deer had died from the cold or something. How do they even live totally exposed in this weather, I thought. But it wasn't really a dead animal type of smell. But I kept walking. Not being from here, I just figured it was somehow normal even though Todd hasn't mentioned it. A few seconds passed where I felt this nervousness in my stomach, but it ultimately went away as I kept walking. The smell faded, but not entirely. The trail through the woods was a straight line. I wasn't sure why Todd even made me a map. All of a sudden, the smell came back out of nowhere. Ten times stronger this time. I almost gagged. It smelled like rotting death. I heard a grunt, and then the sound of hooves or something shuffling slowly through the trees. I started walking again, but now I walked a lot faster. Something told me not to look behind me, so I just kept walking straight down the path. It ended at a bluff. The snow was still falling really thick. I could barely see anything except the town down below. I heard noises behind me in the woods. The trail looked like a dark mouth with all the white snow falling. I really didn't want to go back through the woods. The smell was still awful, and it seemed to be getting worse. It smelled like the woods were full of dead and rotting animals. It seemed even scarier because I knew how cold it was. Everything out here would freeze. So, whatever it was, it was fresh. I stood there looking into the darkness and I saw something. It looked like a deer or elk or whatever it is that lives out here. It looked at me and blinked. Its eyes were yellow with beads of red. It leaned forward just far enough out of the shadow for me to see blood-soaked antlers. But the antlers were black. I don't think I could see any meat on its head. It had a slick skull. It was huge and long like a giant moose or bison. I'm not sure. I froze in place. The thing bucked up and stood on its back legs. It must have been ten feet tall. Maybe bigger. Its body was emaciated, rotting off the bones. The skin was hanging off like ribbons. I snapped out of my fear and turned toward the bluff and the town. I ran sideways along the trees until there was a path leading down away from the woods. I looked back once, and I saw those eyes glowing in the darkness of the woods. I lost my footing and slid on my butt down the path. It hurt, but it gave me some distance from whatever that nightmare was in those woods. I kept going as fast as I could. That smell kept following me. I finally made it down to the ground. The steep trail ended in the back corner of a fast food restaurant parking lot. I wasn't hungry, but I went inside to catch my breath and try to warm up. I was freezing and sweating at the same time. I waited there for a while. People came in and out. Totally normal. I wanted to scream at them about what I saw, but I stayed quiet, of course. I would have sounded like a crazy person. After I warmed up a bit, I walked back to my sister's house. I went the long way around thought. I took the streets and didn't go back into the woods. Years ago, I was an investigative journalist. I had been working on a story about the crisis with contaminated water that had occurred in 2001. Many people had gotten ill, and several had died from various water pollutants, ranging from bacterial pathogens to chemical contamination. 
I had been scouring several locations throughout the United States, but I was focused mostly on areas including Arizona, where the outbreak seemed most prevalent. Sadly, places like Arizona and New Mexico, places with a large indigenous population, were the most likely to be affected by situations like these. Poor healthcare, poor resources, and more specifically, poor drinking water. A lot of my work involves interviewing and observing people involved with the process. I spoke to several heads of water treatment facilities, local government officials, and the like. None of them seemed to find the situation a pressing matter. It made me frustrated and sickened to know that so many people were allowing things like this to happen. But that rant is for another time. This story is about something far more complicated and less likely to be resolved than the water issues that were so utterly dismissed. Of course, I didn't just talk to the people who were in charge of implementing better practices for water safety. I spoke to the people who had been directly impacted by the situation. This meant going to various communities and seeing the conditions that they had been experiencing. I had looked at several lakes and reservoirs. I had been to many homes and I had seen my way around plenty of rural areas. So when I happened upon something unusual in the sky that late October morning, I was completely scared out of my mind. I had agreed to meet with a woman at her home in a rural area of Arizona. She had been sick and so had three of her children. I felt like this story would help open the eyes of the public. Seeing a mother and her young children ill due to poor water conditions might be enough to outrage the public. But I had to admit I wasn't sure I'd be able to handle the sight. It seemed too grim for anyone. It was a story, though, and an important story that needed to be resolved. I was nervous about it all. It was a huge story, one that would stir up all sorts of controversy and emotions. I had to put my feelings in my back pocket. Despite the placement of my nerves, however, my hands wouldn't stop shaking. I was driving to the woman's home. The road was harsh and bumpy, so between the road and my shaking hands, I don't know how I managed to steer my car. I remember that the air was cool and crisp, and the leaves had started to change color. It was pretty, but the sensation of it all now makes me sick to think about it. I knew that there was a lake near the woman's home. So, I wanted to make a quick stop to see if I could spot anything unusual. The lake was pretty small for being a lake. There were plenty of flies circulating the area, and also a horrendous odor coming from the water. Being that this lake was one of the main sources of water for the woman's area, I wasn't surprised that the conditions would be short of decent. So I took out my camera. I snapped a few photos, and I took out my notepad to take several notes. I even had a small vial to collect samples. I wanted to make sure I had something to take back to a lab to get tested. As I'm doing all of this, I start to notice a strange sound from above. It sounded like wind, but not really. The sound was like a gust of wind, but more intense and shorter and rapid. Sort of like the sound of a large bird with heavy wings flapping. I looked up, but I didn't see anything. The sound stopped. So I continued examining the area. Trash was thrown about. It looked as if someone had made an encampment of sorts. Probably someone living off the land. As I approached the encampment, I started to hear the flapping sound again. This time trees were above my head so I couldn't see much of the sky, and this time I didn't like how close it started to sound. It was loud and aggressive, so I was beginning to get a sense that whatever it was, it didn't want me around. I wondered if it could have been a mother eagle with a nest somewhere close by. I wanted to respect its boundaries, so I made my way back to my car. I sat in my car for a second while I reread some of my notes and examined some of my pictures. But as I sat there, I started to hear the sounds again. And with every whooshing noise, they seemed to get louder and more intense. At this point, I'm beginning to get scared even despite being in my car. It sounds far too loud to be an eagle, and also it sounded much larger. I put the key into the ignition, turned it, and I drove off. I sped down the road, but I kept trying to peer out my window and also above to see if I could find whatever was harassing me. For quite some time, I didn't see anything. But suddenly I noticed a strange shadow in the sky. All I got was a glimpse of it, 
a very quick glimpse. What I saw absolutely did have large wings. That was definitely the source of the noises, but it was very odd. It was as if this bird or whatever it had very long legs trailing behind it, with talons attached. I had never seen a bird with long legs like this. Well, other than a flamingo, but I was certain it wasn't that. The best way I can describe what I saw was that it was a bird with human-like legs. It should have been terrifying, but I wasn't necessarily scared of it. Strangely, it didn't seem like it was threatening me. More so, I felt like it was protecting me. A long time ago, I lived in the remote mountain town of Costilla, New Mexico. It was very small. My family had lived there for several generations, and the house I lived in was the house that my grandparents lived in. In small towns, everyone knows everyone. And being that our family had always resided there, I really did know everyone. So that's what makes the events that occurred very unusual. It all started with strange things being left on our doorstep, things like unusual bottles of liquid and broken glass. Sometimes we would find that someone had left chalk sigils or drawings in the sand outside of our home. It was obvious that whatever was happening was intentional, that someone had purposely left these things for us to find. But what we didn't know was why, and that totally creeped me out. I didn't mention my worries to anyone outside of the family. The things that were happening were just so unusual and I didn't know who I could trust. Our town was small but it was very religious. Everyone in town was Catholic, so every single person would be seen wearing rosaries. No one left home without them. So as strange things kept happening, I refused to go anywhere without my rosary. Even when at home, time would come and go, and so would the strange items. We were very scared of what was to come. Were these omens? Were they symbols of what was to come? Eventually we found something far more unsettling. On the day it all happened, it was a nice day outside, so I wanted to open the windows and get some housework done. I had laundry to do. The house needed a good dusting. And a friend had brought us some lovely tomato plants to put in the garden. I wasn't naive. I knew to be cautious of the gifts. But honestly, nothing bad ever came of those tomato plants. They were good plants that gave us plenty of good, healthy tomatoes. Anyways, I did a lot of the indoor work and moved to the outside garden. I wanted to get the tomato plants in the ground as soon as possible, but I still had a lot of cleaning up to do in the garden beds. I anticipated being out there for some time, and I was... I had spent three good hours out there until I finally stumbled upon them. I was at the side of my house, and I was cleaning up some debris out of the pots and beds. I moved towards the windowsill as I had some pots and a small bed near the window. This window went straight into the kitchen. I had spent hours and hours at the window every day between cooking multiple meals and washing the dishes. So if something was left there, I would have noticed immediately. But I must not have, because when I go to clean up the windowsill, I find five small figurines. Each of the figures was about three inches tall, and each had what appeared to be human hair, and looked like people I knew, my four siblings and myself. The scary thing was that the hair looked like our actual hair. I could recognize a clump of my own hair from a mile away, because if the unique curl it had, and I knew without a doubt that this doll looked like me and had my hair, I immediately went to my sibling and told them what I had found. We all agreed that the best thing we could do was burn the dolls. So that night we lit a bonfire and we threw the dolls in. We made a grand night of it all, but I suppose the celebration was a bit too soon. When my brother went to put out the fire, he realized that the dolls had not been affected by it. Not one bit. It was as if the dolls were never touched by fire. I know it's hard to believe that little dolls made of wood would not have burned in that fire. Trust me. I don't want to believe it either. But it happened. We knew that something beyond our understanding was happening. We knew that these dolls were intended for harm. So, we decided to bury the dolls far from our home. But then months later, my siblings and I started getting sick. 
One by one, we all started to fall terribly ill. We didn't know what was happening to us. The doctors couldn't explain it. My brother, a very spiritual man, suggested that we see a medicine doctor that helped one of his friends in the past. When we went, the shaman explained that we were ill from a type of spiritual darkness. In that space with him, we felt that it was safe to describe our experiences to him, and we told him about everything that had happened. The bottle of liquid, the glass, the sigils. The man explained that those things weren't actually what was bad. We were shocked to learn that they were there to protect us. However, the dolls were not. The dolls had a different purpose. The dolls were what had made us sick. The medicine doctor suggested leaving the dolls in the ground, that our hair was the main anchor to us, and that it would eventually decay in the earth. And with that, he performed rituals meant to help heal our spirits. I wasn't sure how much I really believed in what he did, but I was so worried that I didn't care what we did as long as it helped us get better. And miraculously, it did. Within days, we all regained our health, but we never got answers. We never found out who brought the dolls. We never found out how they got our hair. We never found out who was there protecting us. All of these things I still do not know. All I know is that my kids and their kids have all learned of all the generations of my family left on this earth, none of us dares to throw their hair in the trash. I explained to them what happened. And I explained that the trash is the only place I can think of that the demons could have found our hair. And then I have them burn their hair so no one, no matter what their intentions are, can do again what has been done to us. When I was a teenager, maybe 16, my parents decided to go on a summer trip to Big Bear. It started off great, but it turned into the freakiest vacation of my life. My family is very outdoorsy. My parents and little sisters love camping and walking trails any chance they get. I like it too, but it's not really my idea of a relaxing getaway. My parents planned a week of outside stuff like hiking and lake swimming that had my sisters bouncing off the walls. As for me, I was looking forward to kicking back and enjoying the resort's amenities like the jacuzzi and workout room. Since we had separate bedrooms, I figured we'd get along fine. When we got there, the check-in folks told us about the resort's bear and wildlife precautions. It was mostly just about dealing with food trash and keeping an eye out just in case. Not really a big deal. The resort was also right next to some campgrounds. Our suite was on the third floor, and the balcony overlooked the campgrounds, which was cool because it was a nice view, and we could watch the campers. There was this one group of campers who'd set up pretty close to us. They had this thing where they'd sing around the campfire in the evening. If that sounds like a nightmare, it really wasn't. They were solid musicians. Nobody just hauls a violin on a camping trip unless they know what they're doing. Anyway, they'd start playing around eight or so, and we'd get treated to guitar and banjo, along with that violin for a couple of hours. I liked reading while I listened to them. They always wrapped up by ten, probably out of respect for the resort's mandatory quiet hours. On the fourth day of our vacation, I was reading on the couch after dinner while my sisters and parents played a board game. The windows were open for airflow because the building didn't have air conditioning, so it was easy to hear the nightly music. I must have drifted off. I woke up about 45 minutes later and something seemed weird. It took me a second to realize it was because the music had stopped. There was still over an hour left before quiet hours, so it was strange that they stopped so early. I shrugged it off. I figured they'd gotten tired or maybe just run out of songs. No biggie but it was a little disappointing. The next morning, I decided to start my day in the workout room. As I was leaving, I saw a reusable water bottle sitting behind one of the treadmills. It was one of those nice steel ones, cobalt blue and shiny. I knew whoever left it would be back, so I ran over to turn it in at the front desk. On my way out of the lobby, I passed by a couple employees coming in the front doors. They were whispering to each other and looked worried. I couldn't make out much, but I clearly heard one of them mention something about last night. I wanted to ask them what they were talking about, but I wasn't sure they'd tell a teenager, so I just went back to our suite. 
Turns out I didn't need to wonder too long, because the sweets landline rang while we were eating lunch. My dad picked it up and listened for a minute before hanging up. He said it was an automated notice from the front desk. Basically, we weren't supposed to freak out, but someone had seen a young bear out in the campground. The guests didn't need to worry, but please make sure to fully clean up if we cook or eat anything outside. They also said to avoid spending a lot of time in the surrounding areas at night, and to report any more sightings immediately. That night there was no singing, and that's when I figured that the campers must have seen the bear yesterday. They were probably staying quiet tonight just in case. It was disappointing because I'd really liked their music, but what can you do? I went to bed without a problem, but around midnight I woke up to a loud noise. It sounded like some guy shouting or cheering, like a woo sound. It only lasted a couple seconds, but I was kind of mad. The quiet hours existed for a reason, and there's nothing I hate more than inconsiderate neighbors who wake me up in the middle of the night. If I hadn't managed to get back to sleep pretty quickly, I would have been even more annoyed, but I guess mountain air is good for tiring you out. Next morning, I decided to go for a quick jog around the area instead of hitting the weight room, so after I told my parents where I was going, I headed out. On the way, I passed the entrance to the campgrounds. There was a group of people loading tents and bags into their cars. I recognized a few instrument cases in the pile, so I knew these guys must have been the singing campers. They all looked like they hadn't slept all night. They looked really nervous, too. After I got back to the room, I ate breakfast with my family before heading out to explore all the touristy stuff. There was time for a swim in the resort pool, too. After that, we had to start packing so we could be ready for checkout time the next morning. My sisters wanted to go on a night hike since there hadn't been any bear sightings that day, and they nagged enough that my parents gave in. I was tired from the day's activities plus my morning jog. I stayed home so I could go to bed early. I fell asleep easily since I was pretty tired, but I woke up suddenly because I heard someone shouting. I don't remember what time it was exactly, but I do remember being annoyed. It was past the start of quiet hours, but it sounded like some guy whooping and yelling. It must have been the same guy that woke me up last night. But unlike last night, he wasn't just yelling for a couple of seconds, he kept going. I decided to go out on the balcony to see if I could figure out where the yelling was coming from and hopefully tell the guy off. Once I got outside, I could definitely tell he was somewhere in the campground in front of me. He sounded close too. It was 1997 and I was camping with my sister at Craig Lake State Park in northern Michigan. It was the middle of summer and unfortunately we're expecting a heat wave on the exact week of our trip. We had both taken off from work already so we decided to go anyway and try to enjoy it. We planned to sleep in our hammocks and brought bug nets to hang above them. If you've never been to the Midwest, we have mosquitoes here that are just huge. We brought a tent too as it looked like we might have a little rain in the middle of the week. But neither of us wanted to sleep in a tent when the nighttime temperature didn't look like it was going to get below 80. Our campsite was a hike in spot, but it was only about four miles from the parking lot. We were both sweating buckets by the time we hauled all our gear to the site, and I wondered if we would be able to survive the week or if we would roast alive. Most of the week went fine. Very hot and a little miserable, but we didn't run into anything strange. When I hear people tell stories like this and there is almost always something they missed in hindsight, but here, there was nothing out of the ordinary. Nothing at all. On the fifth day, it had begun to rain about halfway through the day, it started out as a little rain but got significantly worse as the day progressed. It was just starting to get bad as we returned from our morning hike, so we took down our hammocks and set up the tent. By dinner time, it was pouring. We obviously couldn't get a fire started, so we cooked dinner in the vestibule on a little butane stove. The tent had started leaking about an hour or so later, and then the wind picked up. There was a pool of water on the floor of our tent when we decided we'd rather hike the four miles back to the car. We figured we could probably find a hotel room in town and if not, at least we would be dry in the car. 
The trail to the parking lot was well marked and we should have easily found our way back. The rain and wind were making it hard to see, so when we thought we saw the red taillights of another car, we headed straight for it. It looked exactly like taillights, bright red and glowing in the distance. It looked maybe 60 or 70 feet away from where we were on the trail. The trail had gotten soupy from all the rain and it became difficult to tell if we were on it or not. We tried to use the light as a guide to follow back to the parking lot, but we ended up stepping directly into a swamp. The sudden change in footing surprised us both and we fell forward into the mud. It was that sticky type of mud that holds you in. I don't think it was quicksand, but it was difficult to get out of. When we had climbed back onto the trail, we sat there on the ground staring at this light that appeared to be dead center in this swamp. My sister was worried it was a car that had driven off the road, but it wasn't sinking and we didn't hear anyone screaming for help. I didn't know what it was, but something felt off about the whole situation. If it was a car, it's not like we would be able to help them anyway. We barely got ourselves out of the mud. We continued on in the direction we hoped was the parking lot. We decided we would call the police about the possible stuck car when we got back to ours. The rain got heavier if that was even possible, and the strange red light faded into the distance. Not more than ten minutes later we saw another light, red, about three feet off the ground. Looked just like the taillight of a car. This time it was in the middle of a forest. I recognized this area. We were almost to the parking lot but this particular area was heavily wooded. No way would a car even fit between the trees in here. I said it can't be a car, that it must be a person with a red lantern or a red headlight. My sister called out to see if anyone needed help. No answer. My sister wanted to go in there and see what it was, but I definitely did not. But the longer I stared at the light, the more I wanted to investigate it too. I felt strange watching it almost like I was in a trance. And then the light moved. It dropped to the ground. It was maybe one foot off the ground now. It came towards us, slithering like a snake through the trees. I had an overwhelming sense of dread. My sister and I didn't need to say anything, we just ran. I looked back to see the red light following us, but it stopped when it got to the edge of the trail. I never figured out what it was. My sister didn't have any explanation for it either. We did call the non-emergency police line when we got back to our car and reported a car possibly stuck in the swamp, but her and I both knew that whatever was out there wasn't tail lights from a car. I spent a few years working on a cattle ranch in South Dakota. It was near the Badlands, but not near enough to be scenic. The land was flat, rolling prairies. There were groves of trees in areas, but for the most part, nothing but open sky. The pay wasn't great, but housing was included. I was in my early 20s, so it was a good enough setup for me. Now I was never one of those people who believed in the paranormal or the supernatural or any of that stuff. I was never religious. I only believed in things that I could see, hear, and touch. Despite my skeptical nature, I always liked listening to local myths and legends, but I never searched for truth in any of them. One such legend was that of the Thunder Horse. It's an old Sioux story to explain the origin of storms. Supposedly, this Thunder Horse was some ancient creature that used to roam the plains of the Midwest. The creature was described as being from a time long in the past. The Thunder Horse, for some reason, disappeared from the plains, but every once in a while, it would return to hunt bison. The sound of its hooves made thunder as it chased its prey across the plains. As the herd of bison ran, their hooves would strike rocks and send sparks across the sky. That was the lightning. From what I remember of the story, people wouldn't often witness the thunder horse, but they would find its bones from time to time. Sometimes the ranch hands would hang out together in the evenings after work and tell local legends like this one. We would talk about our family's silly memories of our youth and how much work sucked. More often than not, we ended up talking about our animal encounters in the wild. Who had seen bears, wolves, moose, and bobcats? None of us had ever seen a mountain lion. 
There was a ranch hand that was with us for only a few weeks. I'll call him Cole for the sake of this story. He was a quiet guy, maybe a little strange, but he was a hard worker. I never had any problem with him. I knew he didn't like storms and would stay indoors at night if there was any possibility of rain. Pretty odd for someone who works outdoors, but I didn't want to pry. Cole didn't really talk unless he had to. On the rare occasions he would hang out with us after work, he just sort of sat there and listened. One day we were talking about the bison herds in Custer State Park. I don't remember how the conversation got there, but Cole asked us if we knew the legend of the Thunder Horse. He was sitting there opposite me across the fire and wrapped in a wool blanket. I didn't know Cole well and he was sometimes hard to get a read on, but he looked afraid in that moment. He told us he saw a thunder horse one time. It was in the middle of a storm, and he said it was the most terrifying thing he'd ever seen. I don't think any of us believed him, but the rest of the guys thought he was strange enough that they kept their thoughts to themselves. Cole left a couple of weeks later. I don't know if he quit or was fired. He was just gone one day, and we didn't think anything more about it. The following summer, I had all but forgotten about Cole. We had a raging thunderstorm pass through the plains. The weather radar said it was going to be a bad one. We typically leave our horses outside 24-7, but the winds were predicted to be ungodly, so we were setting up panels in the barns to make stalls for all of them. We were cutting it close to get the barn ready in time. The rain was already pelting me as I was leading the last of the horses in. And looking at the winds, I would be surprised if the roofs were still on all the buildings come morning. I could see the cattle pasture out of the corner of my eye. I couldn't see it well because of the weather, but I could tell they were upset. I figured it was the storm. There wasn't much I could do for them except hope they didn't bust down the fence. A flash of lightning lit up the sky and I saw what was upsetting the cattle. The two horses I was leading spooked and got away from me. And I didn't blame them. There was a beast in the cattle pasture that stood about eight feet high. It looked prehistoric. That's the only way I can think to describe it. I only saw it during flashes of lighting. It had hooves, but it looked more like a giant rhinoceros than it did a horse. It looked like something you would find roaming the earth in a time with mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. Its hair was pure white. It was longer than a horse's hair and kind of shaggy. It was about the size of a moose, but it was like no other animal I had ever seen. I saw it maybe six times when the lighting lit up the sky and allowed me a good look at the beast. The next flash of lighting and it was gone. I thought I had some type of hallucination, but then I remembered Cole's story. I so wish I knew where he ended up because I'd love to talk to him about all of this. Now I can't explain what the Thunder Horse actually is or where it came from. Or if that is even what I saw. For all I know, it could be some prehistoric ghost. Something happened to me over the summer. I live in Montana a state known for wide open ranges, high mountains, and best of all, trout fishing. I guess I've seen A River Runs Through It too many times because I spend nearly every single free moment of my time out on nearby rivers and streams fly fishing. There are about a dozen different bodies of water within an hour's drive, and each one has quality trout fishing. While Montana is relatively unpopulated, some of the more popular places can get a little crowded during the busy months. Every serious fisherman has their own secluded secret spot, and I'm no exception. I found it a few years ago, and have seen maybe two other people on the stream in all that time. I was there on the day that this story takes place. It's about a two-hour drive from my home in Polson, so I left the house a little bit before dawn. I had fishing buddies, but never showed anyone else this secret spot. After the drive and a further hour hike, I was on the river. It was a clear day and the river is wide enough that you can see pretty far both up and downstream. I hit some of my usual spots. Deep pools, downed trees, and some shallow rapids. The morning was warm and it was beginning to heat up quickly as the sun rose. Trout tend to get lethargic in warm water and I was afraid it was going to be a waste of a day. 
I really didn't want to leave empty-handed, so I decided to walk upstream a bit. Maybe I would find a mountain stream runoff, which would make the water in the vicinity a little cooler. I fished my way upstream maybe two or three miles, alternating between walking along the bank and wading in the river. I had never really explored this stretch of the river before, and the land before me became wilder and more beautiful with every step. And that's saying something for Montana. Despite the captivating scenery, I caught a strange feeling that I couldn't quite seem to shake. It felt like I was walking into an area where I didn't belong. Like I had stepped back into a time when man was at the bottom of the food chain. The rocks and boulders became more jagged and uneven, and even the trees seemed to loom larger, like towering sentinels peering down at a clumsy intruder. I did my best to ignore the feeling and just kept casting out hoping my fly would get noticed. Fortunately, the water became a little shallower, and I was able to wade further out into the water and create some more casting room. It was while I was standing in the center of the river, mid-cast, when I noticed it. Across the river on the opposite bank, one of the trees began moving and then another. Shaking violently, I could see leaves and pine cones falling from above to the forest floor. Something was moving from deep in the forest, heading in my direction. And whatever it was, it was big enough to make a 60 fat tree shake and sway as if from a hurricane. I yanked all my line in with my hand and grabbed it up in a bundle. No doubt it was a tangled mess, but I had bigger problems to worry about. Wading through water is tough, and I probably wasn't going to get back to the shoreline before this thing emerged from the other side, but what choice did I have? I turned and came as close to a run as I could. The footing was slippery and I kept having to feel around with my feet to find the next safe stepping spot. I kept pushing forward and could begin hearing a massive thump, thump coming from behind. It was getting louder with each passing heartbeat. Now terrified, I threw my $500 dollar rod into the water and began taking long, risky steps, just praying I didn't step into a hole or slip into the water. Plenty of fishermen have drowned after falling in and having their waders filled with water. I had almost reached the other bank when I heard a thunderous crash behind me. I could help but turn and look. As if out of a fantasy book, a literal giant stood before me. It was at least half the height of the fifty feet pine trees. A patchwork garment of a dozen elk skins covered it from the waist down. The gargantuan fist held down at both of its sides seemed as if it could envelop me whole. I was somewhere between full terror and complete awe. A living creature of legend was standing in front of me, and its pumpkin-sized eyes locked with mine and held my gaze. Then it opened its mouth. This was the only time in my life that I can say that I felt a noise. Inhaling a tremendous breath, the creature roared a single explosive word, Go! Mimicking the size of the creature, the single word was long and expansive. I hadn't initially comprehended that the thing had just spoken. As I stood unresponsive, mouth agape standing in water up to my thighs, the creature stooped and uprooted a two-ton boulder from the rocky shore. Single-handed it reared back and then launched it like a catapult, the stone monolith slamming into the water only ten yards away. A shower of water, rocks, and wood rained down on me and I had to cover my hands with my head. Several smaller stones ricocheted from the tossed boulder, hitting me all over which later turned into nasty purple welts. Snapping out of my stupefaction and realizing just how threatening this situation was, I began racing towards the shoreline, kicking my legs high out of the water like a flamingo. Back turned to the monster, I felt another impact somewhere behind me, globs of water soaking me even further. I was breathing hard and felt a surge of relief when my foot hit the rocky bank. I climbed out without looking back and raced towards the tree line as quickly as my soaked clothing would let me. I ran thirty feet into the wood before tripping and falling face first onto the ground. When I stood up and turned back towards the river, I could see the immense creature lumbering back into the forest on the far side of the water. I stood watching and listening and its loud thumps slowly faded away and I could no longer see the tips of the trees swaying from its passing. I quickly returned to my truck and went home. 
I know this sounds far-fetched like a child's fairy tale or something from Lord of the Rings, but it happened. I thought about calling the police or even the media, but in the end, decided not to. This thing could easily have killed me, but all it did was chase me away. It just wanted solitude and to be left alone, something I could relate to. That's why I went there in the first place. I won't be returning to disturb it. Maybe there are things in the world, creatures and such, that should be left alone. Maybe we should stop trying to find them. I've worked in a government research facility since I left college. That was back in the 1990s. I was first recruited because of my background in chemistry and biology. I'm not going to talk about where I worked beyond it being outside a major metropolitan city and a place where you wouldn't expect to see a large government-funded lab. My team and I worked on what could best be described as subliminal hypnosis programming. Our job was to introduce programming into subjects without them realizing what was going on. The hypnotic programming was designed to cascade. The more the subject was exposed to the programming, the more complex the alterations we could introduce. The most important or interesting, if you don't have a moral code, was that we could eventually change the behavior of the host organism without its conscious decision. There have been many behavioral modification experiments done over the decades. If you know what a Pavlovian response is, that's exactly what I'm talking about. But nothing has been tried on this level and magnitude for a few decades. If you remember the subliminal ads of the 1980s, where images were embedded in other images so that the eye would pick them up, but the conscious mind wouldn't recognize them, you'll have an idea of what our modification programs could do. Coca-Cola wanted consumers to buy their sodas. We wanted other things. Our experiments started on smaller things, like rats. Their high levels of intelligence and adaptability made them ideal for this sort of thing. When the rat-based experiments showed promise, our team was allowed to move upward. Cats, unsurprisingly, were not responsive enough to the programming, but canine subjects proved particularly well-suited. Our baseline experiments were able to change the subject's behavior. Making a dog sit when you walk in the room is something anyone can do. Making a dog sit only when someone wearing a particular coat comes in the room is different. Those were the proof that the program worked. But that wasn't where it stopped. Before I go on, I must stress that the facility I worked in was in a major urban area. When the program moved to the next phase, we were all relocated to an installation in the Badlands of South Dakota. Our test subjects now were people. I never knew where they were from. The research staff was discouraged from making small talk. Our job was to run an experiment, and interacting with the subjects was not going to help with that. I must also stress that we were all told that the experiments were designed to help curb addictive behavior. Exposure to the programming, delivered through a simple screen or through headphones via a music screen, was supposed to help people with drinking problems, smoking problems, gambling problems. I'd thought that an odd application because our initial tests had been designed to produce a positive behavior in an animal subject, not an avoidant behavior in a human one. But I, like the rest of my team, stayed quiet. Our livelihoods were on the line. Our initial testing went well. After several sessions, the subjects all reported aversion to the target behavior. We received more funding and more subjects. And then it all went wrong. Some of my team was sequestered for additional work. We weren't even allowed to talk to them, and they were housed in a separate facility to say nothing of the separate workspace. The colleagues were both psychologists and social scientists. Then one of our subjects had an adverse reaction with a cardiac arrest. The program went on hold for a few days while investigations began. I don't know what happened to him, but I do know that his body was cremated on site. I found that curious. Not only had he died of major health events, his body had not been returned to any family. When I asked if anything was being done to notify any next of kin, I was told that no such person had been in the program and no one had died. The program resumed, 
and there were thankfully no more fatalities. However, we got better and better at layering the subliminal suggestions to create very complex behaviors that could be triggered by a particular stimulant, say a sound or an image. These complex behaviors would immediately overwhelm the subject and override the conscious will, making the subject act in ways that they would not normally and without any physical cues, such as anything that could be read by a body language expert. In other words, we were creating secondary personalities that could be activated at whim. In every experiment, errors occur and another one happened. This time, when the subject snapped, it was violent. One of my colleagues was killed and four of the floor security guards died before the subject collapsed. Aneurysm. This time, our program went on hold pending another investigation and our research was terminated. We were disbanded, but kept within other government programs. While all the records were scrubbed, I suspect they still exist somewhere in the depths of the dark web. I would discourage anyone from trying to find them. You may believe me or not at your own discretion, but looking for answers is never something that comes without a price. I know that all too well now. Anyone who's ever driven south to north through South Dakota on Interstate 90 has likely noticed that there aren't a whole lot of rest stops that are open, and I'm about to tell you why. The state can't get anyone to clean them. Yep, you heard that right. The state cannot find anyone to clean the rest stop bathrooms, despite being willing to pay someone well to do it. In fact, a few years ago after I quit the gig, they ran the ad for months before they finally just decided to close all but two of them to the public, leaving north or southbound travelers through the eastern half of the state to have to hold it until they hit the next down, which is sometimes half an hour or more between them. If you've made that trip recently and found yourself caught off guard by the lack of available bathrooms, I'm sorry. It's all my fault. Let me tell you what happened. For years, I'd been cleaning those rest stop bathrooms almost religiously every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. I live right up by Wapiton, North Dakota, but on the South Dakota side of the state line, which made me eligible for the contract all those years ago when I bid on the job. On my working days, I'd get up early and drive south the whole length of the interstate and back, hitting every stop along the way to clean the bathrooms and make note of any maintenance that needed to be done so I could alert the state on that. Nobody ever thinks about us rest stop cleaners, and that fact is made evident by how often I'd roll up on one and find it absolutely trashed. People don't have a lot of respect for what isn't theirs anymore, and one winter a few years ago I found myself battling it out silently with someone that was intent on making my job hell. It started out that I'd show up and just find the trash cans tipped over and the garbage strewn about, old diapers and used feminine products and paper towels. It was an unsanitary and unwelcoming mess, but I knew what I was signing up for when I took the job, so I didn't let myself complain too much about it at first. After a few times of it, though, I got smart and bought myself a chain and padlock and chained that trash can to the wall in such a way that nobody could tip it or take the lid off without the key. The next couple times I went to clean up, I found out it had worked just right and the messes let up for a while. Eventually, though, I went and discovered a sight even more horrid. Piled up in the bathroom floor were three different deer corpses, all of them busted open with their entrails hanging out. I called the sheriff to come down and check that one out, and when he did, he shook his head and said he couldn't understand it either. Upon closer inspection, though, he realized that none of the deer had been shot, and they were all in varying stages of decomposition, meaning they hadn't been killed at the same time, or even on the same day. When the game warden showed up and took a look, he showed us some busted rib bones and vertebrae that seemed to indicate the deer had all been hit by cars. In the morning, blood puddles on the asphalt in three separate places nearby. The rest stop all but confirmed it. We were left scratching our heads. Who would do such a thing? Over the next several weeks, though, it happened over and over and over again. Finally, the sheriff decided to dip into his own wallet and set up a camera to try to catch the sicko. But when it happened again and we went to check the camera, we couldn't believe what we saw. 
A tall, gaunt, white creature with antlers was what dragged all those dead deer into that bathroom. It had eyes that reflected light just like the deer, themselves, and even paused at one point, noticing the camera but didn't do anything about it. The tape got turned over to state police, who were quick to tell us that what we saw was a prank and not to tell anyone about it, lest we made the state look foolish. I've always been a little loose-lipped, though, so a few nights after that, when I was hanging out at the Indian casino, having more than my share of drinks, I let it slip what had been going on at those truck stops. A Lakota man working the craps table looked at me and his face got real serious. He told me I needed to quit that job because what I'd been dealing with was a Wendigo. He told me, he's dragging those deer in there to tell everyone he's mad about the trucks and cars not slowing down. He'll be dragging the bones of people in there next. I called my state contact and quit the job the very next morning. They ran the ad for a while, but then opted to shut the bathrooms down. I'm not sure in hindsight if it was because they couldn't find anyone to work, really, or if they were trying to prevent word from getting out about what's been going on with the Wendigo. All I can say is if you're traveling through the state at night, keep an eye out and don't stop between towns. Something's out there. My wife and I are antique collectors. We live in Massachusetts near Salem, which isn't just a coincidence. We moved here after getting married. We both prefer things on the creepy side. Think Ouija boards, old dolls, clown figurines, you get the picture. We have enjoyed doing this for the past four years that we have been together. We actually met at a creepy con when we were 21. It was nice to finally meet someone who enjoyed the same things I do. I don't enjoy dressing up crazy or anything like that. I just like creepy things, and I have ever since I was a kid. About six months ago, we found a very old porcelain doll. We believe she dated back to the 1920s, but we were not ever able to fully verify this. She was very fair-skinned with perfectly painted freckles and long locks of soft strawberry blonde hair. Her porcelain face did have a fair amount of crazing. Crazing is what happens when the porcelain starts to crack. My wife was really excited about the doll because she had the brightest green eyes we have ever seen on a doll. We paid the $250 asking price and took her home to add to our collection. We even gave her a name, Iris. Now we love creepy. We love interesting. We do not love scary. There is nothing fun about being scared, and I prefer not to even think about it. So, we bring Iris home and place her with the rest of our doll collection. We have a guest bedroom that has a day bed, and that is where we set them all up. We put her in the middle, but in the second row since she was a bit taller than some of the other dolls. We didn't enter the room for about a week until my wife went in to do some cleanup. I immediately heard a scream, so I went straight to the room. Most of the dolls had been knocked over. Iris was still where we placed her. I told my wife that it must have been our cat. We straightened up the mess and left the room. Now this is where things get strange. You don't have to believe me. I know what I saw and what I experienced. This was a life-changing experience for not only me, but also my wife. We started to hear things at night like something scuttling across our hardwood floors. I would have to get up and go get our cat because we thought the cat had zoomies. Almost every time poor little Salem was in his cat bed. One night, though, I heard the scuttling and got up to go find Salem, only to see he was in bed with us. I told my wife the next morning that we needed to hire an exterminator because I thought we had mice. We walked into our living room and Iris was sitting on our couch. She was in the same position we had placed her in on the doll bed, but on the couch. We looked at each other and I asked my wife why she would move Iris to the couch. My wife claimed they had not touched Iris and swore that I was the culprit. Obviously it wasn't me. I grabbed Iris and took her back to the guest room. When I entered the room, I was shocked. All of our precious dolls were on the floor. Many of them were broken beyond repair. I started crying and my wife came into the room. We were both shocked. We salvaged what we could and estimated our losses at over $2,000. 
there were a total of 16 dolls broken. It was devastating. We didn't know what happened. Did someone break in and we didn't hear it? Was Salem playing in the room? We just didn't know. We reorganized the room and put Iris in a rocking chair near the window. We also decided we would keep the door shut from that point on, just in case Salem had gone on a doll rampage. I didn't go into that room for about a month. I honestly didn't want to. My wife is a more logical thinker but me. I am thinking the worst. I started googling strange happenings with dolls and I even tried to find out some of Iris's origins. I couldn't find out anything about the doll. Nothing. Not even any information on the company who made her. There were no records of anything anywhere. I told my wife that we should get rid of Iris. It did not go over very well. I was told I was being ridiculous. I didn't feel I was being ridiculous, but I left the situation alone. We were still hearing the scuttling at night, even after the exterminator came and checked our house. We had no mice, just a small cluster of spiders in our laundry area. Spiders don't make that much noise. I was spooked. I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was extremely thirsty. I opened our master bedroom door, and when I did, I heard the guest room door snap shut. I went straight to the door and opened it back up. In the light from the hallway, I could see that Iris was sitting in the chair. She was not in the position we had left her. Her head was tilted towards me as if she was looking at me and the chair was rocking. I let out a screech and my wife came from our room to find out what was happening. I explained what I had heard and seen, and we closed the door. I was almost hyperventilating. My wife said I was overacting and reopened the door. Iris was now looking towards the window and the chair was rocking at the exact same pace. It had not slowed down. My wife looked at me and told me we were getting rid of that doll now. And that's what we did. We put her in a dumpster behind a fast food restaurant up the street. We will not buy any more dolls. I enjoy not hearing scuttling throughout the night and not having my things broken. I think it is better this way anyways. What happened to me happened in my last year of college at the University of Utah while studying for a degree in conservation. Instead of going home for winter break, I signed up for a short internship shadowing a park ranger. It was only going to last a month, and the park ranger I was going to be working with had a station next to a huge ski resort. I'll say right now that I'm an avid skier and had been hoping to do more skiing than working, but that didn't end up being the case. I had less than a week left of my internship when we got a call about an animal in distress somewhere along the road towards the ski resort. And ironically, that was the last place I wanted to be. I think I had maybe gone skiing twice since this whole ordeal started, and I felt like the universe was laughing at me at this point. I can't really complain about the job, though. It's exactly what I signed up for, and Noah was a great guy to work for. I just wished I would have been working maybe a little less, especially over the holidays. When we got in the ranger truck, I asked Noah about the details of the animal incident. Usually when we get a call like this, it's a collision with a vehicle. Sometimes we can help the animal and take it to a rehab center, but a lot of times we can't. I felt relieved when Noah said it wasn't a vehicle accident. He said the report was from multiple people going to and from the resort, that they either heard or saw a puppy crying for help, but no one could catch it. I asked Noah why we got called instead of animal control or something. He said it was because there is no animal control out here, and who knows, it might actually be a fox or something. Plus, we weren't doing anything else. Don't get me wrong, I'd much rather search for a lost puppy than see a mangled deer with two broken legs from a vehicle collision. Actually, though, I'd rather be skiing. We finally reached the area where the sightings had been reported, and we searched everywhere for it. And I mean everywhere. We probably looked for two hours, but still no puppy. Noah drove us to the ski resort to get some coffee and to warm up a little after spending nearly two hours outside. I figured by this point, we had tried our best but was starting to fee that we were going to have to give up on the puppy. But Noah wasn't willing to throw in the towel just yet. We finished our coffee and Noah ordered two sausage patties to go. 
I was still silently hoping we had given up and I might get a couple of runs down the mountain today, but it looked like we would be setting a live trap with the fresh sausage as bait. We drove back to the location where the puppy was last seen and set the trap up a little ways away from the road and behind the cover of a few trees. Noah put the sausages in the trap and said, I don't know if we're going to catch it, but I guarantee something is going to be in here come morning. And he was right. We drove out first thing in the morning to check the trap. You could see the trap from the road and the creature that was in it was a little husky puppy. Pure white with blue eyes. There were tracks around the trap too. But tracks of something much larger than the puppy. They looked canine in nature. I asked Noah if they looked like wolf tracks, and he said no, that these were bigger than wolf tracks. Was it some type of really big dog then, I asked? Dogs don't get that big either. Was the only thing he said it. We didn't discuss the tracks any further. We just took the puppy to the truck and drove it back to the ranger station. In retrospect, that was a mistake I won't soon forget. The puppy was skittish and disinterested in us. We set it up in a pen at the ranger station and put out a notice that we had found it, hoping to reunite it with its owner. Noah and I had some other outside work to do that day and left the puppy alone at the station. It wasn't a great situation, but at least it was warm and had access to food and water. Work ran a little longer than usual, and we didn't get back to the station until after dark, which is only about 4.30 this time of year. Nothing exciting kept us out. Just a couple of trees that needed to be cleared off the public access road to one of the parks. When we got to the station, we both looked at the front door and froze. There were claw marks up and down the door. The door was still latched, but just barely. Noah told me to stay in the truck, but I didn't. We both walked up to the door. Whatever made those marks was big, like the size of a bear. We didn't see any tracks leading up to the building, so we had no way of identifying what it might have been. We went in the station to find everything in place. The door had held and had managed to keep whatever was out there, out. And amazingly, the white husky puppy was still there, looking like it was waiting on dinner. Noah and I stayed at the station for another hour doing our end-of-day paperwork. He told me I could go if I wanted, but he was going to stay a bit later. My car was parked around the side of the building, and I was about to get in it when I noticed tracks leading up to the window of the ranger station. It was obvious that whatever had made them had been looking in at us. I examined the tracks closer, and I was certain they were from the same animal that had earlier been hanging around the trap. I ran back inside to tell Noah what was going on, but he stopped me as soon as I opened the door. He had been coming for me, too and whispered to be quiet because he had heard something strange outside. From the inside I could hear it walking through the snow, just on the other side of the wall. And then there was a thud as I heard it jump onto the porch. Noah and I were both afraid to breathe at this point. And then that damn puppy started howling. And then, as if responding to the cries of the puppy, the creature outside stood up and looked through the window. I only saw it for a brief moment before falling to the floor, but it looked like some sort of wolfman type creature. Its hair was pure white and it had piercing blue eyes, the same blue eyes as the puppy. Noah looked over at me and I knew from the look on his face that he had made the connection too. If it wasn't for Noah, I'm pretty sure I would have been attacked outside by this creature. He used his key remote to set the alarm off on the ranger truck, and that was enough to scare the beast away from the building for a second. And we used that second to open the station door and let the puppy out. And that was it. All the commotion ended immediately. The creature left and never came back. So, I am going to be really real with you right now. Whatever I just went through isn't a joke. I'm not laughing. I'm freaked out. This isn't normal and I don't even know if I can cope. Some of you might be able to, but I'm not okay with this. I went out two nights ago to this little club in Huntington, West Virginia. My friends and I had a great time, danced a lot, met some new people. It was an all-out good time. I kept my head right because I knew I had to drive myself home. 
No good time is worth my freedom or my life. It was around 1.30 in the morning and I decided I'd head back home. I had a seminar at noon and the class I'm in is difficult, so I need all my rest. So I grab some gas and a snack at the little gas station around the corner and start my 45-minute drive. I'm listening to a random pop station, doing a little drive dancing, nothing too crazy, and singing my heart out. I have all the windows down since it's pretty cool out and the air feels great. As I'm driving down this little two-lane road, my check engine light comes on. My car starts making a sputtering noise, so I pull over and turn on my hazards. I am not a mechanic by any means, but I take a look under the hood. Really, that was just to make myself feel like I had done something. I'm not going to lie to you. At this point, I know I got to call a tow service or something, because I need help. Of course, I wouldn't have service where I broke down at. If I didn't have bad luck, I'd have none at all. There's no one else out at this hour, so I start walking and checking my bars as I go. There were a few cows just standing in this pasture to my left, doing what cows do, I guess. They seemed pretty unbothered. Once I got to the end of the pasture, I heard the cows moving and mooing. They were running in the opposite direction. I can't lie, I laughed so hard. I'm thinking about how these cows had the most delayed reaction to my presence. I check my phone and keep walking past the end of the pasture. That's when I saw it. I'm just going to describe it the best I can. I've never seen anything like that, and I really hope I don't ever again. Just past the last pasture gate, I saw what I initially thought was a man. At first glance, that's what I thought. This man looked bulky, like maybe he had something on his back. I felt relieved at first, but then just fear. My blood ran cold. He didn't have anything on his back. He stretched out wings. He was only maybe six foot tall, but his wings had to be like nine or ten feet wide. In the moonlight, I could see that they weren't like bird wings. They were like, I don't know, a moth or an ugly butterfly. They were a grayish, dusty color. He moved his head slightly, I think to get a better look at me. When he did, his eyes caught the moonlight and they were bright red. I started screaming. I tried to dial 911 on my phone, but it didn't connect. I still had no bars and I'm staring at this scary night creature down. I just started panicking. I'm not good under stress. I ran back towards my car. That was the only thing I could think of doing. I didn't hear anything behind me, but I kept running. I don't know what I thought I was going to do when I got back to my car. I dropped my phone, and I had to double back a few steps and find it. When I looked over into the pasture, I could see him standing there. I don't know if he ran or flew there with those big behind wings. There he was, just watching me. Once I found my phone, I went right back to running. I could see the cows in the pasture, and they were all bunched up and mooing loudly. I'm thinking they are probably just as scared as I am and got nowhere they can go. I felt bad for laughing at them earlier. I'm maybe 20 feet from my car now. I can't even put into words how scared I was. My phone wasn't picking up a single bar. I knew my car wasn't going to magically start. I'm going to have to fight this man. That was the only conclusion I could get to. That's when I saw headlights. If I wasn't so busy running, I would have cried. I moved to the middle of the road, just running down that yellow dotted line. If they didn't stop, I was a goner. I didn't want to be a goner. I waved my arms up and down, and I just know I looked crazy. Not as crazy as whatever was stalking me from the pasture, but crazy. This old man stopped. I didn't want him to not help me, so I didn't say anything about someone chasing me. I needed his help. I was so lucky. I have never been lucky, but I was lucky then. This man had toe straps and was able to hook me up. I had to steer my car while he towed me, and when we passed the pasture, I didn't see that creature anywhere. I spent the whole time thinking he was going to pop up in my back seat or something. I stayed at a hotel in the nearest town and missed my seminar. The local mechanic fixed my car. They were really nice there, but I am not going to drive through there again.
I grew up in a family that worshipped the outdoors. From a young age, me and my brothers were encouraged to challenge ourselves physically and be ready for anything. That led me into my career as a park ranger. By the time I was in my late 20s, I was working in gates of the Arctic National Park in Alaska. I had a real need to push my endurance levels and overcome harsh conditions. I also wanted to become a climbing ranger, so I developed a training regimen. One time I was doing a solo trip into the mountains. Temperature was around 15 degrees and there was a heavy storm. The wind was around 35 miles per hour and a whiteout was threatening. It was getting late and the visibility wasn't good at all. I was pretty sure I was the only person crazy enough to be on the mountain in those conditions. But that kind of thing exhilarated me. And I really wanted to lead climbing expeditions someday. I wasn't totally familiar with the whole region. A lot of it was unknown territory for me. I'd scouted it on the map and figured out a decent campsite up on a pass. There was flatter terrain up there and a few nice ridges that should protect pretty well from avalanches. I was focused on my GPS. When I found one of the ridges, I knew I was closing on to my chosen campsite. I was looking down into the sheltered area between the ridges. I suddenly heard this strange bellowing sound. It completely threw me for a loop. I wasn't expecting to hear any other creature out there. I immediately froze. My mind was searching for an explanation, but I was thinking, what the hell was that? Definitely not a human. Reindeer? Did it sound like reindeer? There weren't many animals around in those harsh conditions. But then I had the thought that I wasn't that far from an area where muskox tended to roam. I really didn't want it to be a muskox. Those will charge at people who get too close. I estimated the sound was 20, 30 yards away. It was disorienting with the winds blowing around the pass from different directions. I tried to look in every direction I could. I couldn't tell where the sound had first come from. Then I heard it again. It was a strange mournful howl. Something I'd never heard before. It definitely wasn't a reindeer. I kept thinking it sounded otherworldly. The rational part of me kept thinking muskox. That was the most likely answer. This time I knew the direction of the sound when I heard it. It was coming right from a sheltered area between the ridges. And I was still standing on top of a ridge. I felt vulnerable. If a muskox charged at me, I wouldn't be able to outrun it, and there was nowhere for me to go. I considered speeding away in the opposite direction of the sound as fast as I could go. But then I thought if I could set up my tent, I'd probably be safe in it. I headed away from the area where I heard the bellowing, but I kept looking around and behind me, feeling really paranoid. I found a flat spot where the wind was calmer. I walked around the spot for a few seconds and it seemed like the right size area to fit my tent into. I threw off my backpack and gear and looked backwards to where I'd heard the sound. Through the snowdrift I couldn't be sure what I was seeing. I saw a large shadow but it was faint. I couldn't tell if it was moving or if it was the snow and wind moving around it. I stared into the snowdrift for like 20 seconds, but I just wasn't sure if there was a huge animal watching me or not. I decided my best option was to get my tent up really fast. At least inside I would be hidden from view. I kept constantly looking back toward the shadow to see if it had disappeared, but every time I looked, it was still there. I can't tell you how disorienting it was. My brain was going in circles. Could it be a muskox? Could it be a rock? As soon as the tent was up, I moved my gear inside and closed the tent and felt sheltered. But the sounds the wind was making with the tent cloth was crazy. It was hard to distinguish if I heard a step from a heavy animal or if it was the tent flapping or what. I kept thinking I heard the sound of a large animal breathing close to the tent. I got into my sleeping bag and put my shovel and ice axe right next to me just in case. Then I heard a high-pitched cry. This one was like a scream. I couldn't help myself. I had to look out. This time it was close enough to see and I was instantly petrified. It was huge and upright, probably eight feet tall. It was powerfully built and covered in shaggy dark hair. The head was ape-like with a really pronounced brow. 
It looked up at the sky and screamed again. My reaction was so out of control. My heart was beating so fast, and I just couldn't control the fear. All I could think was Bigfoot. I curled into a ball in my sleeping bag and just covered my head with my arms. That's all I could do. I felt helpless and just stayed like that all night long. At daylight, I finally looked out and heard only silence. I felt really shaky on the trip back down. That encounter definitely affected my confidence but I persevered and stayed in the business. But these days I'm at a national park in California. I need a little time before I go that remote again. When I was 15, my parents moved us from our Chicago suburb to a tiny town up in northern Minnesota. My father had lost his job when the factory shut down, and he had a cousin who offered him work up there. I was obviously less than thrilled to be changing schools partway through high school, but moving to a freezing northern town made it a million times worse. My parents insisted that it was a beautiful area and that with the lakes nearby there was a ton of outdoor stuff we could do. We moved in June just after we finished the school year. As it turned out, the summer wasn't awful. It was surprisingly hot. My dad's cousin let us use his boat and we spent a lot of time out on the lake. Dad took us fishing a few times, and we even started playing hockey just to fit in. Then in the fall, school started. The new school we went to was ridiculously small compared to my school back in Chicago, but I made some friends pretty quickly, and I decided that I could survive these last two years before returning to Chicago for college. Then, winter hit. Winter in Chicago had been tough, so I thought I was prepared. Nope, this was absolute hell. The temperature was regularly in the single digits, if not below zero. Also, we were close enough to the lake that the wind chill dropped at another 20 degrees. I barely left my room most days, except for school or hockey practice. By February, I was going stir-crazy. Then by spring, we started to get warm spells. And out of desperation, my brother and I begged my parents to take us somewhere, anywhere. They ended up suggesting we spend the weekend at the State Forest about an hour away. Our parents had bought everyone kayaks for Christmas, as a peace offering for the move. The park had tons of lakes and rivers, so we were going to kayak and hike, and camp overnight. We got to the park Saturday morning, with no problem. We found a campsite, set it up, and then lugged our kayaks to a launch point. We kayaked around the lake for hours, taking pictures of wildlife, fishing, and just hanging out. When we returned to the campsite, we walked around for a little while, but then made a campfire and had dinner. Despite the abnormally warm day, it was still supposed to get cold overnight, so we had brought extra blankets and lots of them. The kayaking had taken a lot out of us, so we all fell asleep right away. In the middle of the night, I woke up needing to go to the bathroom. I ignored it for as long as I could, not wanting to get out of my sleeping bag, but eventually I had no choice. I wrestled my way out, trying not to wake my brother up, and threw on boots and my coat. The tents were in a clearing, but there was a small stand of trees maybe 20 yards away, so I headed there. I definitely wasn't going all the way to the campsite bathrooms. I didn't bring a flashlight, because the moon was bright enough that I could basically see where I was going, and I wasn't going far anyway. I stepped a few feet into the trees and took care of business. Just as I was finishing up, I heard a sound, definitely an animal sound. I wasn't scared, just curious. I was still getting used to seeing wildlife everywhere, and I had a running tally of the things I'd seen in the wild lately. I was hoping it was something cool like an elk or moose, maybe even a wolf, although that probably would totally scare me. I stayed silent, waiting to see what it was. I heard a few more faint sounds, but couldn't see anything. I was freezing, so I decided to head back to the tent. Just then I saw something moving between the tree branches. Based on how tall it was, I wasn't sure it was a moose or elk. I thought about trying to wake my family up quietly because I was sure they wouldn't believe me. But I was afraid it would be gone before we could all get back to see it. So I stood still and kept watching. After a minute I saw a flash of something moving again and heard it getting closer to me. 
It came out from between a stand of thick evergreen trees. At first, I couldn't figure out what I was seeing. I saw the face first and immediately thought wolf, but the head was way too high. Besides, the face was just wrong. And then out came the rest of it. And I saw its body. It was walking on two legs. It was tall, at least eight or nine feet tall. The body wasn't completely human. The arms were too long and it was slightly hunched. The legs were muscular and all four limbs ended in claws. The whole body was completely covered in fur, dark brown, almost black fur. The creature stared right at me with glowing amber eyes that were far too intelligent. It opened its mouth and let out a weird half pant, half grunt, letting me see its razor sharp teeth. That was enough to send me running. I screamed the whole way back to our tents and headed for my parents' tent. Of course, by the time they got up, the hideous creature was gone, and of course, they didn't believe me. They insisted that I was either still asleep or had seen shadows playing tricks on me in the woods. But I knew I knew what I saw. Back home, I searched online and eventually found exactly what I was looking for. Some pictures were different, but a few were almost identical to what I had seen that night, and they were all calling it a dog man. I refused to ever go back to that park. My hometown wasn't known for much, except for a couple of ghost stories centered around an abandoned railroad bridge and an unexplainable blue light. I never put much faith in the stories personally, but the old railroad bridge did become a hangout spot for troublesome youth, me included. The railroad bridge crossed a river. The river itself wasn't very deep, but the drop from the bridge was significant. The last train ran across the tracks in the 1970s, and the bridge had begun to fall apart since then. Sometimes we would walk out on the bridge, but it was unnerving, even for the bravest of us. There was a railing on one edge, but the other was just a straight drop down, and many of the planks were rotting and unstable. There was a forest leading up to the river beneath the bridge, and trails you could access from the road. That's how we would get to the bridge. We would cut through the forest and climb up. To be honest, the forest always creeped me out way more than the bridge. There were the ruins of an abandoned farmstead down there, and it always hated going past them. I suppose I should get to the ghost stories and the origin of the blue light. There are two stories that try to explain it. No one knows which one came first, so I always tell them both. The first story centers around the farmer that owned the land beneath the bridge and his missing wife. The foundations of several of the old buildings are still there, but trees have closed in the space. The really creepy part is the old water well that's still there. Imagine a set of stone stairs leading down to a creepy well in the middle of a forest. Anyway, the stories say that the farmer's wife mysteriously disappeared. Some versions say she hopped on the train and left him. Others speculate maybe she was kidnapped or even killed. I tried to look her up in the town's archives once, but I couldn't find anything going back that far. The farmer was distraught and looked for his wife everywhere. Day and night he searched, wandering through the forest, carrying only a lantern. He searched for her until the day he died, and if you believe the sightings of the mysterious blue light, he is still searching for her. The other story says the blue light is the headlight of a ghost train that periodically crosses the bridge. I guess the original construction of the bridge proved to be difficult, and a few workers were pretty severely injured during the project. Another theory dates back to a train accident in the 1930s. Again, I tried to look up all these events at one point and couldn't find much information. And yet, people have reported seeing and sometimes hearing a train on the bridge years after it officially shut down. My experience with the blue light happened on a Friday night. A few friends and I went to the bridge to hang out and have a couple of beers. Sometimes we would play a game to see who would go out on the bridge the farthest. It was dumb, but I was 17, and the prospect of falling off the bridge never even crossed my mind. I will say, though, no one ever made it all the way across. We always chickened out. I was near the middle of the bridge when I caught something out of the corner of my eye in the river below. I peered over the railing. It looked like something iridescent, shining under the water. I couldn't say what exactly it was, 
but it had a blue tint to it. Was the blue ghost light real? The longer I looked at it, the more it pulled me in. Almost like a trance, I got the urge to follow it, right over the railing of the railroad bridge. Later that night, my friends told me it looked like I was going to jump off the bridge and they were screaming at me to come back. I don't remember any of that, but I do remember hearing the horn of a train blast right in my ear. It was so loud, it nearly knocked me over. There was no train on the tracks and the blue light in the water had disappeared. I got off the bridge as quickly as possible and told my friends I wanted to leave. They kept asking what I was looking at on the bridge, but I didn't have a good answer for them. I just said, I think I saw the ghost light. We went down the hill and into the forest. It was nearly dark and I knew we would have to pass by those creepy farmhouse ruins, but I just wanted to get back to the car. When we did reach the ruins, my friend grabbed my shoulder and asked me what I saw in the water. His voice was shaky. I said I'd explain when we got back to the car, but he stopped me. I saw something come out of the river, he said. When you were running back from the bridge, I don't know what it was. It looked like a woman. Great, I said. We can talk about it back at the car. At this point, I just wanted to get out of here and never come back, but he stopped me again and told me I didn't understand. That the thing that came out of the river went straight into the forest. I didn't want to look back at the ruins, but I couldn't help myself. There was a faint glow from the entrance to the old water well. It was the same blue glow I had seen from the bridge. This was no ghostly farmer searching for his lost wife. I wanted to run, but I felt frozen again, just staring at the light. And then I heard the horn of a train again. It was enough to bring us back to our senses and run out of the forest and to the safety of the car. I never went back to the bride, and I never figured out the source of the mysterious blue light. But I can say for certain that the ghost train isn't what you need to be afraid of. There is something else out there in the water below the abandoned railroad bridge. I was on a hunting trip in West Virginia, my first in years. Eight of us in a cabin meant for four made it very uncomfortable when we would bed down at night. After the first night, I decided to buy a tent and sleep in that. I'll take crickets and owls over a symphony of snores any day. A few of my friends sat around a fire with me until they called it a night. I stayed up for probably another hour. I've always enjoyed solitude and nature. It was peaceful and just what I needed. My job doesn't allow me much time off and I had secured a week on this trip. It was about midnight when I heard some raccoons off in the distance. At least I thought it was raccoons. They were squabbling over something, most likely some food. And though I was enjoying my time away from the city, I remember wishing I had brought something to drown out the noise while I tried to sleep. Eventually the animals quieted down and I was able to rest. The raccoons must have settled their differences. We were up bright and early. We got a jump start on the day. Our deer stands were undisturbed, and the footage we got on our trail cams promised some successful hunting. There were two of us in the deer stand I set up east of the cabin, myself and my buddy Ted. Ted had never been hunting before, and I decided if I spotted a deer that I would let Ted take the shot. We waited all day in that stand. Hunting takes a lot of patience. You will be bored most of the time, especially with the discipline it takes to be silent. Deer have an incredible sense of hearing. We were just about to call it a day when we heard several shots off in the distance. Anytime I spot one, it seems like one of its kind was taken down by our group somewhere and it would be spooked. I think it happened three times in a matter of hours. Ted had gotten down already and was making his way to the cabin. That's when I heard the raccoon sounds again. It was getting to be nearly dusk so I remember thinking that was strange. It wasn't even dark yet, and raccoons are for the most part nocturnal. I guess you could say the day was a success. Three of the eight had bagged a deer. Ted and I were a little jealous, I'll admit. We'd get one tomorrow, I assured him. It was only the first day. We celebrated my friend's victories, well into the night. 
The next morning we got a late start, but we dragged ourselves to the tree stand, and we waited for a long time. Ted was searching the tree line with binoculars. He tapped me on the shoulder and handed them to me. He pointed south and tried to help me find what he had spotted. At first I didn't see anything. Antlers, he whispered and moved the binoculars a little. I still didn't spot what he had seen. He pulled them back and adjusted them a little, but he dropped them quickly. His face went pale. I asked him what was wrong. He stammered a little and pulled them back up to his eyes. He gasped and said something like, What the heck is that? I grabbed the binoculars again and tried to see what he was talking about, but he was climbing down the ladder and told me to follow him, so I hurried down. He was jogging but whispered to me, I saw a deer but think it's already dead. I could have sworn it was moving though. I don't know. It was in some underbrush. I remember suggesting something could be tearing at it out of sight, vultures or a coyote or something. He got turned around, but I remember how shaken he was. We looked back at the direction we'd come from and decided on which way we thought it was. Ted suddenly didn't want to lead the way. Maybe it got hung up on a fence and starved. Maybe someone dumped a carcass or bagged a deer that wasn't up to regulation. It happens. Someone could have run out of tags. We rationalized it. Quietly, as we approached the place he thought he'd spotted the deer, a putrid smell hit me like a ton of bricks. Something was decaying nearby. That smell is undeniable. Ted slowed down. He stopped and stared ahead. I couldn't figure out what he was looking at, but when I turned around, my heart stopped. I heard the raccoon sounds again, and there was something standing in the underbrush. It looked dead. This thing was probably nine feet tall with antlers. It had the face of a deer, but only the skull. Its flesh looked like it was melting off, and it was moving. It turned its head toward us and revealed these horrifying yellow eyes. They were hollow but glowing. I dropped my gun. Years of hunting, but I dropped my gun. We just stood there in complete shock. Ted had left his gun in the stand, and I started to panic. I bent down to grab my gun and something went off. It wasn't my gun. I hadn't pulled the trigger. I was shaking so hard, but it wasn't me. One in our hunting party had taken aim at a deer, and I heard him shout in the distance. The thing in front of us ran. It wasn't fast, but it rambled through the trees and away from us. I didn't shoot at it. I couldn't. I remember Ted telling me to shoot it, but I couldn't. I just stared. It was horrifying. I'll never forget that smell, the smell of rotting flesh and death, and those glowing eyes, the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. No one expects something unexplainable to happen to them. Every day goes by in routine. Work and errands become a blur. Self-care becomes an afterthought. Then the unexplainable happens. Maybe an accident shakes the foundation of your life. Maybe the company you work for suddenly goes belly up. Or maybe you just see something. That's what happened to me. I looked where I shouldn't have. I stared when I should have blinked. I don't think I'm the only person guilty of that. The weird and the tragic have a way of pulling you in. Even I wasn't immune to that kind of gravity. I used to take walks. Long walks. Through the city or across the surrounding wilderness, I didn't care. Stretching my legs helped me think. It cleared my mind. It settled my nerves. I would have dealt with my stress in a different way. But how could I have known better? This particular walk had taken me into the woods. It was a wet fall. The trees were empty, and the ground was a cold sludge. The sticky slurping sound on the bottom of my shoes didn't even slow me down. I was enjoying my day with nature. I listened to the birds that day, but heard nothing. I then looked for animal tracks, but the mud was empty. They'd all gone home, I guessed. What I ultimately heard was a whirring, a loud chopping of the wind, not unlike the sound of helicopter blades. Chop, chop, chop. But there wasn't a landing site for miles. 
If it was a helicopter, they would have been coming down in an emergency. I ran to see if I could help. Before I could reach the sight of the whirring blades, the sound stopped. The forest became eerily quiet, as if I was the only one left among those trees. Then there was a sharp hiss, something like a hydraulic press unburdening itself of a massive weight. Whoever or whatever it was, it was still nearby. I smelled it before I saw it. Linen and bleach. It wasn't altogether unpleasant, just out of place. Why would this stretch of the wood smell so medicinal? I pulled the neckline of my shirt up to cover my nose and continued. Nothing extreme had happened, but my curiosity was already piqued. I needed to know. The smell got stronger as I moved. I gagged and spit and leaned against a tree to try to catch my breath. Whatever I was looking for, it had a fully realized arsenal to use against me. My forearm remained propped on the nearest tree as I heaved and cried. The smell was too strong. It felt like I'd been thrown in the washer with a bottle of detergent and the spin cycle was still going. I threw up. It made me feel better. When I looked up, wiping the excess from my lips, I finally spotted the source of the smell. It was a small man. It was a small thing shaped like a man. I don't think it was human. It stood with a hunch. The creature's arms hung so low that its fingers nearly dragged on the ground. Its back was covered by a large, mucus-like bubble. Its face was more frog than human. Wide-set eyes and a wide mouth. It didn't blink, and it was unfazed as it looked my way. I don't know if I was paralyzed by fear or disoriented by the horrible stench, but I couldn't bring myself to turn away. I couldn't run. It tilted its head like a curious dog. The expression was so familiar to me, so harmless, that I almost laughed. Almost. My motor functions slowly returned. I can't say why without admitting that I'm an idiot, but I moved toward the thing. I took an entire step forward. Its face twisted into something like a scowl. The bubble on its back swelled and the cruel scent got more intense. I imagined streaks of the odorous weapon rising from the creature's spine. I couldn't keep myself from coughing. This time, the fit brought me to my knees. I landed on my palms, facing the ground, and heard the creature's heavy footfalls run in the opposite direction. It didn't mean to harm me, I decided. When I could breathe again, all I wanted to do was see it again. The wonder and the fear had quickly faded. I wanted a picture of the thing. I followed its tracks in the mud. Strangely, its feet were grooved like the soles of a shoe. I didn't remember it wearing anything on its feet. I pursued the footprints and the scent as quickly as I could, slowed only by the occasional wretch. I was lightheaded and dizzy by the time I found it. I wasn't lucky enough to see the creature again, however. It had already found its escape route. What I saw wasn't a beast, but a light. An orb of blinding white light, as bright as the sun on a summer day, shined in the middle of the woods. I shielded my eyes, trying to get a glimpse of the orb through the cracks in my fingers. I tried raising my phone and snapping a picture. The screen only came back white. Then the chopping sound returned. Chop, 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 from the exact location of the orb. I felt the wind kick up and collide with my face. Then the sphere was gone. I heard the hydraulic whine. The light seemed to jump, and then nothing. I was alone, dizzy and sweating. The taste of bile still coated my tongue. The authorities said I caught a fever in those woods. The doctors backed them up. Dehydration and disorientation compounded into an intense waking dream. If I did hallucinate, I haven't done so again before or since. I've found very little information on the creature that I saw that day. That encounter remains my one truly unexplainable day. I don't trick or treat anymore. That doesn't sound entirely uncommon, does it? If anything, it makes me sound like a perfectly reasonable adult. Unfortunately, this is far from a reasonable story. What I should say is that I don't open my door to children anymore. I'm checking the blinds before any time I head outside or crack a window or hold a conversation through the mail drop slot on the door. Maybe some red flags have gone up in the neighborhood. I don't care. 
You know the Michael Jordan meme about the kids? That perfectly summarizes my feelings. See, now this sounds a little more extreme than a 40-year-old who's canceled Halloween. That's good. You need to be willing to accept the extreme if you're going to listen to the rest of this story. Halloween 2016 I'd tell you that I live in Chicago, but then we'd have to get into regional semantics. Just know I'm in the northern suburbs, about 40 minutes outside the city. Halloween in my neighborhood used to be nice. The locals go pretty hard with lights and decorations. The same guy runs a little fun-sized haunted house out of his garage every year. Nice neighborhood, nice weather, nice holiday. I was geared up and ready to do my part. Sitting on the couch, re-watching a classic vampire flick with periodic stops to the front door to shovel out chocolate for the kids. In 2016, I even wore plastic teeth. I popped them in before opening the door and gave every child who stopped by my best count impression. I may have looked more Sesame Street than Bram Stoker, but what can you do? Seven in the evening rolled around, the cutoff time in our neighborhood, and I started to shut it all down. Porch lights off, candy bowl back in the kitchen where I could scavenge from its brim for the next month. Then came the familiar rapping of tiny knuckles against my wooden door. I wasn't upset yet. I wasn't even annoyed. The kid was late and saw my lights had just gone out and was trying to score one last handful of candy. I get it. The grind doesn't stop, right? I grabbed the bowl, slotted my fangs back into place, and turned the switch for the porch light. There was an electric crack as the bulb blew out. I laughed and reached for the door handle. At that moment, I was willing to bet that the light going out had totally made the kids Halloween. As soon as the door was opened, I realized how wrong I was. There wasn't a kid at all. There wasn't anyone. I called out, turned my head up and down the street to see if I could catch whoever had knocked and ran. The moment the lock on my door bolted into place, the phantom outside my door knocked again. I jumped. I spilled some candy. I laughed and cursed and scrambled to open the door a second time. Whoever this kid was, they had definitely gotten me back for the light bulb situation. It was dim when I opened the door, right? The porch light had gone out. The interior lights could only do so much to illuminate a kid who was standing outside. What I saw? I don't think it was a child at all. It was wearing a mask. It had to be wearing a mask. Whoever designed it definitely deserved an award of some kind. It looked like latex stretched over something that was vaguely the shape of a face. Like a head made out of right angles concealed by this blanket of skin. Corners jutted out at the cheekbones and brow line. His eyes, large and deep set, were jet black. Contacts, right? That's what I said. It's what I try to tell myself now. I didn't give this kid the Sesame Street skit. I held out the candy bowl and stood there slack-jawed. My body was going through the motions, but my mind knew something was wrong. I'd never felt fight or flight hit when looking at a child before. But I did this time. He didn't move. He didn't raise a candy bag or reach for a chocolate. He just stood there in his little hoodie. I didn't say anything either. I couldn't find the words. After a few long moments passed, I leaned back into my home and slowly shut the door. Another knock. Should have taken the candy the first time, kid. I reached for the door, inexplicably angry this time. How had he gotten under my skin so quickly? When it swung back, whining on its hinges, I froze again. There were five of them, identical and standing shoulder to shoulder. If my mind had been alarmed before, it was full-on panicking now. I chose flight a thousand times over and slammed the door shut. I've seen that movie, right? No way is that happening to me. When I turned around, eager to retreat into the safety of my own home, one of them ran past me. Across the hallway from the kitchen to the living room, one of those little devils. I knew it was the first kid. I've never turned the lights on in my house more quickly. I searched and I searched, but ultimately came up empty-handed. He got in when the door was open, I knew, but how he'd gotten out. I have to tell myself he got out. It's the only way to get through my day without fearing each shadow in the corner of my eye. He's out there. I'm in here. 
and I'm not opening my front door for a child ever again. I tried reintegrating into my neighborhood's Halloween activities. I told myself that I was probably misremembering the whole ordeal. I must have built it up into a nightmare over the course of the pandemic. This year, for the holiday, I tried sliding candy through the mail slot whenever someone knocked. The parents didn't appreciate that. Then at the end of the night, the kids came back, sliding their crooked fingers through that same hole, scratching at the metal frame. That's when I decided to quit. Every night, I know they're standing there. Sometimes one, sometimes five. They're still out there and they still want in. This happened quite a few years ago now. I was working as a middle school science teacher in North Carolina. The town I lived in wasn't anything to write home about, but I was only about an hour's drive from the coast. But even more exciting, at least exciting to me, were the wildlife refuges. You see, I'm a biologist. And exploring the wild, swampy areas of the state became my weekend entertainment. I grew up in central Idaho, smack in the middle of the Rockies. I did my undergrad studies there and then went to Washington State for graduate school. I never in a million years thought I would end up in North Carolina. I'll be honest, I wasn't too excited when I got the job. I had been looking for work for over a year with dismal prospects. So to North Carolina, I went. I admit the climate is not my favorite. There is a heaviness to the air that never seems to let up. Coupled with the heat of summer, it's hard to convince myself to even go outside some days. But the wilderness areas are magical, 100% worth braving the humidity in the summer sun. One of my favorite things to do was find and watch the black bears. From a distance, of course, they are such fascinating creatures. The black bear population here is one of the densest in the world. Luckily, black bears tend to be skittish and easily frightened by humans. I don't know how many bears I've seen in the Carolina wetlands, but it has to be upward of 100 by now. However, the reason I wrote in was not to tell you about black bears. There is something else that lives in the swamp. The day started out like any other of my wilderness adventures. The kids had just gotten out of school for the year, and I had two weeks before summer school began, so this was one of the rare occasions I was able to go hiking on a weekday. The weather was forecasted to be hot, sticky, and generally unpleasant by midday, so I had started my hike early. I knew the area well, and none of the trails were too strenuous. The path I had planned would take me through the forest and around the perimeter of a swamp. If you've never been to this part of the world, you might imagine swamps to be dull or maybe creepy, but here they are, vibrant and full of life. I had hoped to see a bear or two that day. My walk through the forest was uneventful and thinking back on it, nothing strange at all stood out to me. When I reached the beginning of the wetland, it was alive with croaking toads and birds darting every which way. Everything seemed completely normal. And then I saw it. A black bear. It was almost too far away to even notice, but it was most definitely a bear. My path along the swamp would take me closer to it. Not close enough to bother it, but just enough to get a better look. The bear was close to a grove of trees, almost hidden in the shadows, but it seemed to be moving, albeit slowly, towards the opening of the swamp. It took me nearly 20 minutes of hiking to get close enough to notice that there were actually two bears. I was about as close as I was comfortable to the bears when I stopped and rested on a fallen tree to watch them. I could see something else moving in the shadows behind the trees when a third bear emerged. For a moment, I thought things were about to get interesting, but the bears seemed to keep to themselves. Black bears are typically solitary creatures, so what I was witnessing was nothing short of remarkable. But was as strange as it was exciting. I realized I had not seen one of the bears lift its head above the swamp yet. Bears do regularly graze on plants, but still, this was odd behavior. I decided to stay and watch the bears as long as they would allow it. I noticed more movement in the shadows of the grove. And yet another bear emerged. To say I was stunned would be an understatement. None of these bears acknowledged each other. They were just peacefully coexisting. I sat there on that dead tree for over an hour, I'm sure. 
and by that time I counted the outlines of twelve bears grazing together in the swamp. Their behavior was reminiscent of a herd of horses or cattle. It's not something I ever imagined I would see. I wondered how long I should sit and watch them. How long would they stay out here behaving like this? Would they just eventually wander back into the shadows? Unfortunately, my presence spooked a sandhill crane nearby and the sound of it taking flight alerted the group of bears. I looked towards the bears and expected to see twelve faces suddenly staring in my direction, but that is not what I saw. The bears, or what I thought were bears, all simultaneously stood up. I know what a black bear looks like when it stands up on its hind legs and these things, they weren't bears. They weren't apes either, or any type of monkey. They looked like men, men covered in thick black hair. As soon as they saw me, the entire group ran back to the cover of the trees. I don't know if they were Bigfoot or Sasquatch, but that's what they looked like. I've never heard of those creatures living in groups, but then again, I've never met anyone else who actually saw one. It was an unnerving experience, but I think they were more frightened when they saw me than I was when I saw them. It was 1975, and we were just kids living in the suburbs of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I'd say we were around the ages of 10 and 12. Basically, we were old enough to ride around on our bikes without supervision, but looking back, we weren't old enough to fully comprehend what had happened that day. My friend and I had been wanting to go for a bike ride for a while. I got a new bike for my birthday, so I really wanted to test it out. There was this area that we knew about. It was typically for older kids, but I had heard my sister talking about it, and I really wanted to go. So, my friend and I gathered some snacks and comic books, and we decided that we were going to go up there for a few hours. I had told my mom that we would be at their house, and they told their mom that we would be at my house. It was your typical lie you'd tell your parents to allow yourselves enough time to do whatever mischief you had set out to do without getting in trouble. So, we met at the park. At this point, we are really excited to start our adventure. The only issue was we had to be back home before dinner and we definitely had to be back before the older kids went up there. Basically, we went up there before it started to get dark. But the sky was already turning an orange color so we knew we didn't have much time. I guess we were so excited about our trip that we wasted a good amount of it packing things we wouldn't really need anyways. So we start riding our bikes. Like I said, the sky had a bit of orange, but the sky was mostly still blue. It only took us about 10 minutes to ride our bikes from the park to our destination. So it wasn't too difficult. We get to the spot, and at first, I'm looking at this place like, is this really where the older kids hang out? It looked pretty gross. And the place reeked of sewage. But basically, it looked like some type of creek with a strange cement tunnel. But I looked at my friend. They gave me the thumbs up, meaning that this was indeed the place. My friend looked excited, so I tried my best to look excited too, even though I was slightly disappointed. We parked our bikes up on the slope. And as the slope went down, it created a type of creek, like I said. So, we grabbed our backpacks and headed down to the area towards the creek and tunnel. As we got further down, the smell just got worse and worse. But it didn't seem to bother my friend, and I didn't want to seem like a wimp, so I tried not to let the smell bother me. We get to the tunnel, and you can tell that teenagers hung out down there. The walls were covered in profanity, images of women's breasts and what have you, and there were a bunch of cigarette butts and alcohol cans all over the place. We did feel a little cooler since we actually made it to the place and had a better idea of what went on there. We decided that the tunnel would be like our fun clubhouse, so we found a decently clean area to set our stuff down and we started unpacking our things. The sky was much more orange now, so we knew we wouldn't be able to stay much longer. But I liked to draw, and I wanted to try and redraw some of the stuff I saw on the walls. So I'm doodling away, me and my friend are giggling, just having a good time in the tunnel. And every sound is really amplified there. So our laughter is just so loud. I'm actually really surprised that my parents didn't hear us all the way to my house. 
That's how loud everything sounded. Anyways, we are laughing and I sort of hear the faint sound of like footsteps. So I stopped laughing. My friend stops too. And they look at me. I think they were confused. But I was really nervous that the teenagers had found us. Or that someone, like an adult from the area, caught us doing things we shouldn't be doing. So my heart is just racing. I whisper to my friend, we should start packing up. They nod, and we start stumbling around trying to get all of our things. That's when I heard it. It sounded like a woman's heels on cement. It sounded like they were in the tunnel with us. I start freaking out because I really didn't want to get into trouble. I just got my new bike. My parents were finally letting me be gone till dark. So I turn around. Down the tunnel, to the farthest side that we had not ventured to, there was the silhouette of something so strange. I can't really explain it all that well, but I'll do my best. It was somewhat hunched over, or it looked hunched over to me at least. It appeared to have hair on its head, and honestly it seemed to go onto its shoulders and back. Let me rephrase. It didn't have long hair. The hair was somewhat short and matted down but it looked like they had hair growing from its back and shoulders too. Its legs, they weren't human. They looked like they belonged to a goat or horse. And these too had hair that seemed to be a similar length as the top of its head. And on the top of its head, it appeared to have two pointy objects sticking out from the hair with what looked like two ears that seemed again like they belonged to a goat. So I'm thinking to myself, is this a goat? But that's when the thing stood up tall on its hind legs. And it definitely wasn't a goat. But it absolutely wasn't a human either. I looked at my friend, and they were shaking. The thing took another step towards us, and we didn't give it more time for another. We took our backpacks and ran. We ran so fast, I honestly couldn't even remember going back up that hill or riding our bikes home. I'm not sure what was down in that tunnel, but I was certain that I would never return. And I haven't. So, all this happened on a fishing trip I took to Canada with my dad. We have been doing this trip for years now, basically since I was in elementary school. It's one of the things I've looked forward to the most each year. I really don't know if anyone has ever had an experience quite like this. I tried to search around on the internet, but there wasn't really much out there. If you've ever seen something like this, I'd really like to hear from you. That's why I'm putting this story out there like this, because I want to know if anyone else has ever seen the same thing. For years and years, we always went to the same lake system in rural Quebec. This past year, we had to go to a different lake because the cabin we've always used got booked up too fast. Everyone is obsessed with outdoor vacations since COVID, so that makes it really hard to get reservations and all that. We found a different cabin to rent in the same general region. It was definitely more remote than our usual cabin. At the old place, we could just drive up and park. It was kind of in a cluster of cabins and not super far from a small town. At this new place, we actually had to park the car and boat out to the cabin. It was on the far side of the lake, and had a much more remote feeling. This lake was definitely shallower than the one we were used to. Lots of lakes are surrounded by a little marshland, but this lake had tons of it. It wasn't very forested, just marshland as far as you could see. It stank too. Both my dad and I agreed that we wished we'd researched the lake a little more, but it had been a last minute booking. Some locals told us it was still good fishing, and we hoped that would be the case. We loaded our stuff into the fishing boat and motored across the lake to our little cabin. When we unloaded our stuff out of the boat, I noticed some really weird depressions in the mud. They were really big and really wide. There also appeared to be three very distinct branches on the imprint, almost like it was a massive footprint with splayed toes. I really didn't know what it was, so I didn't think very much of it. We just kept unloading the boat, and I think we destroyed that mark in the mud with our own footprints. It was late already when we got to the cabin, so we did not get to fish at all that first night. My dad and I cracked some beers and sat on the porch of the cabin, looking out over the lake. It was really, really quiet. 
Normally lakes are loud with bugs and frogs and birds. This one was strangely silent. I wouldn't say it was eerily silent, but it was definitely weird. I remember one distinct sound, a long, low, deep thrumming sound that was very consistent. It was a few days later that I actually saw it. We were renting the cabin for a week, and our first few days of fishing were all right. I caught a handful, but my dad didn't really catch anything. This lake was definitely shallow, and the fish didn't seem very big at all. One thing I did like about the lake was that it was relatively clear, due in part to its shallowness. This is why I was able to see that creature. It was midway through the week, and we were over by the north shore of the lake. We hadn't fished here yet, and my dad was hopeful that maybe he could finally reel something in. We both were unlucky all morning not catching a single fish. I could see them down there, but nothing was biting. Suddenly, all the fish darted away, like they all swam away as fast as possible as if they were being chased. I was leaning over the side of the boat trying to see if there were any left down there when it came up by our boat. It was the largest, most gruesome creature I've ever seen. It looked absolutely disgusting and had an evil sense to it. It was the sort of thing I could imagine First Nations people creating stories about to warn their children. It was probably 10 feet long and covered in massive, gross-looking warts. Its legs were probably one and a half times the length of its body and ended in webbed feet with huge, razor-sharp-looking talons on the end. Those claws were probably as long as a steak knife. Its head was the most disgusting and terrifying part. Had big yellow eyes, probably the size of a soccer ball. Perched atop its eyeballs were long, thin spines that looked like horns. This monster swam right below our boat, probably 20 feet down. I don't know if it was aware of us or not, but I did know that this was what those fish had to have been running away from. We watched as it swam away and then turned on our motor and went to a different part of the lake. I don't think I was afraid of it until that night. At first, it just seemed like we'd seen a really cool piece of wildlife, something to report to National Geographic. That night, though, both my dad and I saw it again, and it left us terrified. We were sitting on the porch, enjoying another beer. As the sun set, that long, low thrumming began again, the same thrumming we'd heard the night before. It seemed to be getting louder and louder, and my dad and I were trying to see where it was coming from out across the lake. As we strained our eyes to see in the darkness, something happened that shocked and terrified us both. Probably a hundred yards out, in the middle of the lake, those big yellow eyes appeared. They were staring straight at us and that thrumming got louder. It knew we were here and it was watching us. That absolutely freaked us out and we both went inside and locked the door. We left the next day, and I don't think we'll be going back to that particular lake. I don't know if what I saw was just some freak of nature that had been alive too long, or if it was some sort of ancient spirit. Either way, it really freaked me out. My girlfriend Maria and I both work in healthcare, and the pandemic was, honestly, rough for us. We both got really burned out, especially Maria since she had taken a job as a travel nurse for about six months. It ended up not working out and she came back home to settle in at our local hospital, which is where we met and work now, in different departments. Luckily, Maria made so much money doing the travel nurse gig that we were able to set some of it aside for a vacation once things calmed down a bit. So about a month ago, we decided to finally pull the trigger, take time off and get away somewhere. We live in Tucson, Arizona, so heading south to Mexico seemed like a good idea for an easy and quick five-day vacation. After looking around for a bit, we decided on Puerto Penasco, which isn't too far from us, and the area around it also had some places nearby that we wanted to check out. Even though we had some extra spending cash, I grew up very frugal, and when booking our Airbnb, kept that in mind. I ended up finding a nice condo that was away from the main resort area of the town, but still near the water. We packed up and headed out, arriving the same day. In real life, the condo was a little more run down than we'd expected and missing some key features like dish soap and extra towels. Maria and I are both pretty laid back, so we made do and started looking around for a place to go out to dinner. 
We wanted to avoid the really touristy restaurants but still get good food, so it took a while for us to make a decision. Eventually, around 6.30, we agreed on a food truck that was supposedly nearby, about a 10-minute walk. The sun was starting to go down soon, and after looking at the GPS on our phones, we decided we could stick to more populated streets versus a scenic walk to the food truck. First, we had to walk out of our neighborhood and cut up a path through the sand dune area. And then we'd end up in a little bay area where the food truck was parked near the water. When we arrived, there were other people out and about, so I wasn't too worried, and eventually we got our food and sat down on a bench to eat. We hung out in that area for almost two hours, and at around 8.15, decided to head back and get some sleep. Maria took the lead, and I followed. As we were coming down the sandy spots, I heard a dog start to yap in a way that made my anxiety spike. I grew up with an overprotective dog and recognized the bark as a kind of warning bark, so I stopped and started to look around. Maria told me she felt it was fine and not to worry, and just keep going. But within a few seconds, at least two other dogs started barking furiously, too. We were just about at the bottom of the dunes, and I almost tripped trying to hurry. This area wasn't well lit, and I just wanted to get to the sidewalks. A car drove by, and I felt a little bit better. We made it about two or three streets away from the condo, and were looking at the closed businesses as we passed, talking about what we should do tomorrow. That's when I glanced down a side alleyway and froze immediately, seeing a dog in the shadowed area. Maria also stopped to see what I was looking at and held my arm a little tighter. Come on, she said, let's keep going. It's just a dog. But just as those words left her mouth, two more appeared in the same spot, and then another. They all looked our way and started walking toward us. They were only maybe a hundred feet away. Now Maria and I kicked it up a notch and really started hurrying back to the condo. I was thinking this was a pack of stray dogs following us, and was a little worried knowing stray dogs can be aggressive. I glanced back as we got onto the road that the condo was on and saw that the pack of dogs was still following us. But what stood out to me was that every dog, there were five of them in total, looked exactly the same. They were huge, easily up to my hip, and I'm 5'11". I pulled on Maria's arm and told her to stop and look. We stared at the dogs who were watching us with their heads lowered and their eyes literally glowing. Not that normal green-yellow reflective glow that dogs get at night, but a reddish-orange glow. There were other dogs nearby barking, but this pack of five dogs was completely silent and still as they watched us. They had long bodies, long tails, and short black hair. I noticed that one had a cropped ear. Maria and I finally got back to the condo and let ourselves in quickly. There were streetlights in this area, and we looked out from inside to try and see the dog pack again, but they didn't come out onto the street. We stayed up late talking about the dogs and what they might have been. I'm 100% convinced these weren't just regular stray dogs. First of all, they all looked exactly the same, like clones of each other. And the red eyes are an indicator to me that we were dealing with something paranormal, not natural. In my opinion, I think we came across a pack of hellhounds, although I have no idea what they were doing in Puerto Penasco. Maria didn't agree, and still insists we just saw a pack of strays. Either way, for the rest of the trip, we either ate close to the condo or took our car out when we were going out at night. This was supposed to be a vacation for us to blow off some steam, but I spent most of the time thinking about those supposed dogs and trying to reason out what we had seen. I wish I had been closer to everything that happened. I wish I knew more. If I had been closer, though, I might not have the privilege of sharing this story. They might have realized I was there and saw it happen. They might not have let me quit my job and stay alive. Up until a year ago, I worked for a very prominent corporation. My role was a small one, just delivering orders in a timely two-day fashion. I covered the northern half of a sprawling American city. I can't give out too many details, I'm sorry. Proper nouns are how people get caught. Most of my deliveries went out to businesses. 
Very rarely did I travel into the suburbs to make residential drops. My days were fairly routine. I arrived at the distribution center at 4 in the morning, loaded my blue van, and headed into the city. Deliveries took all day to complete, and every day was basically the same. And then one day my routine changed, and that was the moment I knew that something was wrong. After loading my truck, I was stopped by one of my superiors. He handed me an additional box and asked if I would take it with me. There was no label. No address describing where the box was going to or coming from. It wasn't paid for by any type of postage or stamp. It was an unremarkable box, half the size of a basketball. The cardboard packaging was colored black. I'd never seen a box quite like it. When I asked where the package was going, my superior waved me off. They assured me that it wasn't a delivery. I simply needed to carry the box with me along my route. They promised that other drivers had done so in the past. It was simply my turn, they explained. The box hadn't seen the northern half of the city just yet. The way they described it all was concerning. They said the box hadn't seen the city. I figured they just misspoke but never clarified thinking it was just a simple mistake. In my mind, they were testing some new GPS product that would likely be installed in our vehicles in the future and they were keeping it in the box to keep anyone from tampering with it. The bonus they mentioned, if I completed this trip without damaging the package, was more than enough to seal the deal. So I drove around with my little black box. I kept it with me in the passenger seat. I wanted to have my eyes on it. When I stopped for lunch, I started to doubt my GPS theory though. After spending time with it, I could tell that the package was humming. As I sat in my seat and worked my way through a slice of pizza, I kept glancing over at the box and almost jumped out of the van when it vibrated. I nearly dropped my slice. For a few seconds, I was convinced that I'd been tricked into smuggling a bomb aboard my van. When it didn't explode, I figured I was overreacting because it stopped humming once I finished my meal. In my mind, I joked with myself that the box was just hungry, envious of my lunch break. That or else it was impatient and wanted to get back to the road. For some reason that idea stuck with me. Was the package keeping its own schedule? I returned back to the distribution facility and a different superior retrieved the box from my vehicle. They thanked me for a job well done and carried the package out of sight. I asked what it was. I even pitched my GPS theory. The question earned me a glare and a long period of silence. I apologized and left for the day. That reaction now had me determined, though. I was going to find out what was inside that box. I spoke to the other drivers and learned pretty quickly which of them had already given the box a tour of their delivery route. That narrowed down who would be escorting the package next. I kept my eye on those drivers who would be next. I then watched as one of them received the box and drove it around without incident. The next driver, however, was not so lucky. I arrived at the facility early that afternoon. I had rushed through my deliveries and skipped lunch so that I could arrive before this next driver. I wanted to see him hand off the box. Instead, when he pulled in, I watched as he jumped out of the driver's seat screaming. I kept my distance. I ducked into my own van and hunched down a bit behind the windshield. I wanted to watch as best as I could, but I didn't want to get caught. I watched as the frantic driver was tackled by security. I didn't even know we had security that could deal with that kind of thing. They pinned him to the ground and bound his hands. And might I say that they looked very professional while doing it. That driver was then carried away, hogtied. I guess they knocked him unconscious somehow. Next I watched as my superiors rushed into his truck and brought out the box. I could see from my seat that the black cardboard had been torn open. They were obviously scared. They were all on their cell phones and moving so hurriedly that I wasn't surprised when two of them collided. This caused the box to fall and I could see something tumble out. It was shaped like a small pyramid. Most of it was silver, the color of steel. The way the light hit it, I'm confident it was metal. What I didn't understand were the veins. Thin green streaks ran across the surface of the pyramid. It looked like a leaf or thinly stretched skin. Those streaks were pulsating, throbbing. 
Watching it made my head hurt. Whatever it was, was scooped back into its box and the team of supervisors all scurried off to their offices. Someone was going to be upset with them, I could tell. But I could also tell that the pyramid thing wasn't ours. It didn't look like any piece of technology that I'd ever seen, and plenty had passed through my hands. When the other driver, the one who broke the box, didn't come back to work, I knew something was wrong. I knew my company was hiding something. I quit and I let things get quiet. This channel has given me a unique opportunity, though. I've taken all of the measures I need to stay safe. I think that you and your followers deserve to know. You can spread the word and warn others without endangering me. The big corporations out there are working for someone else. Maybe the government. Maybe something bigger than the government. I think that they're driving around and scanning our cities. They're preparing for something. I don't know what it is. I just know that if I stay silent, none of us will be ready for it. I don't know if you get a lot of college stories, but I've got one. My college was in West Hartford, Central Connecticut. It wasn't a big school, but it was big enough to need three residential halls. The smallest one was Mercy Dorm, which was just one floor converted for residential use in the original administration building. Mercy Building had more than just dorms. The basement level had a preschool where students could work for their practical credits. It also had the laundry room for the dorm at the very end of the wing. A lot of people wanted to get into Mercy because the rooms were bigger than normal and you'd be closer to the classroom buildings. Everybody wanted to skip the hike across the quad. But nobody but Mercy residents knew about the laundry room. The laundry room was freaky. That whole basement was creepy. Going down there at night made you feel like you were being watched. It didn't help that the school usually only had emergency lights turned on in the hallways when the preschool wasn't in session, so it was dark. During the day, it wasn't so bad. The hall lights were on and there was a little light coming through the basement windows. It almost looked normal. At night, the basement just plain felt scary. Everybody thought so. It wasn't the fake Halloween kind of creepy either. It felt more serious than that. All of us residents tried to do our laundry during the day. Unfortunately, there weren't a lot of machines, and even though we weren't a big dorm, sometimes it was hard to find a free one. That meant that you had a really good chance of having to go down to the basement at night. If you were lucky, you were just picking up your stuff. If you weren't, you'd be doing your whole laundry cycle at night. Nobody ever stayed there and waited. We just threw our things in and left. Maybe it was the exposed pipes on the ceiling that made it feel so freaky. I don't know, everybody seemed to have a different reaction. Some people just felt nervous but didn't know why. Some people felt a cold chill. I guess I was different because that wasn't how I felt. I always felt like I was being watched. It wasn't too bad when there were two or three of us trying to do our laundry, but it was really bad when I was alone. At first, I tried to shake it off because there was nobody in the room with me. Then I tried to tell myself it was my imagination. I'd start singing or talking to myself. Anything to make noise? As long as I was making noise, I could fool myself. Everything was normal, but it stopped being normal every single time I went to the elevator. You know how elevators take forever to get to your floor? This elevator was exactly the same way. It was one of those old-fashioned ones where you had to wait for the gate to open. It took an extra long time to get yourself safely into the elevator, because every time I had to go between the laundry room and the elevator, I heard footsteps. They always started down by the preschool, at the opposite end of the hallway. Then they started toward the laundry room on the opposite end of the hall, getting faster and faster until they got to where the elevator was, on the left side of the laundry room. The first time I heard it, I thought the janitor was down there with me, but I never saw him. I thought maybe I missed him, but then it happened again and again, every time. I know I know footsteps. Big deal. But it was more than that. This sense of a threat and anger were present, 
and the more I went down to that floor, the worse it got until I swear I saw a face pressed against the little window in the elevator door as it went up. I was freaked out. I started asking around the dorm to see if anyone else heard anything weird or saw anything they couldn't explain. While everybody said they didn't like the laundry room and even some of the student teachers said they didn't like staying after hours in the preschool, nobody had an experience like mine. My friends and I started checking the library to see if we could find any old news stories that would help us figure out what was haunting that level. I never really expected to find anything, but I was wrong. In an old West Hartford newspaper from 1963, we found a report on an accident at the college. The old boiler had exploded, killing the janitor, Bob Gardner. Just so you know, the boiler was right across from the elevator in the basement of Mercy Dorm. Right across from the laundry room. Guess I hadn't really been wrong about the janitor being down in the basement at the same time I was. You'd think that having some proof that I wasn't crazy would make everything better, but it really didn't. The next time I had to wash to do and I felt that creepy watching you feeling, I started talking out loud. If I had a bucket list at that time in my life, talking to a ghost would not have been on it. And it turns out, just because you think you know one's name does not actually help much. In fact, it got worse. The feeling of being watched started to follow me up the elevator, three floors up. It even started to feel bad in the daytime. But even that was nothing compared to that last night. I was trying to study for my English Lit final. My roommate had already finished and was out partying. All I remember is staring at my notes on Chaucer one minute and the next I felt this horrible pressure all around me. I felt like this cold force was surrounding me on three sides and then I heard this voice whisper scream leave in my head. I have never been so terrified in my life as I was then. I don't know what I would have done or what I could have done if my roommate hadn't come back just then. As soon as the door opened, the feeling and the coldness went away. Was I tired and hallucinating? Or did I get a visit from a very unfriendly ghost? All I know is that I grabbed my stuff and hiked across campus to spend the night in my friend's room. As soon as senior finals were over, I packed up and went home. I never told anybody outside my friends this story, and I haven't thought of it in years. But now I wonder, is Bob still haunting Mercy Dorm's laundry room? When I was little, my grandparents lived right next door to us. But next door in rural Kentucky meant half a mile down a dirt road. When I was old enough, maybe seven or eight, my parents started allowing me to walk to their house on my own. As long as I told them where I was going and made it home before dark. Our road rarely ever had traffic on it and was safe enough for a kid to travel, but I liked to cut through the forest instead. The undergrowth was thick in most places, but I found a deer trail to follow most of the way. It was a lot quicker than taking the road and most of the time felt safer. However, my grandma always warned me that there were things that lived in the forest I wouldn't find in encyclopedias. These things weren't to be trifled with, she said. I used to think she was just telling me stories so I wouldn't go out at night and get lost. But when she learned I was going through the forest to get to her house instead of walking along the road, she told me one warning that would stick with me forever. If you feel something that's not quite right, you get out of the forest. You stick to the road or you call me and I'll pick you up if you want to come visit, she said. There's always something about them that's not quite right. Something you can't put your finger on. Something, somewhere, feels wrong. I asked her what she was talking about, but she never explained it further. I'll be honest, what my grandma said creeped me out. I never went in the forest after dark and I never saw anything weird there. I continued to use the forest trail to visit my grandma. If I ever stayed after dark, she made sure to drive me home. I didn't give her words much thought until one day after school, I was walking along the deer trail like usual and I heard my grandma calling my name. It sounded like it was coming from somewhere inside the forest, but I couldn't figure out the location. I called back to her and asked where she was. She sounded distressed and just kept repeating my name over and over. 
She sounded close enough that I should have been able to see her. I asked again where she was, but she just called back my name. In my head, I knew something wasn't right. She should have answered me and told me where she was. And then I remembered what she told me a few months prior. Something somewhere feels wrong. And I ran out of the woods as fast as my legs could carry me. I ran straight to my grandma's front door and burst inside. My grandma was sitting in the living room in her favorite chair. I don't know if I was surprised to see her there or not. What were you calling me for? I asked. I didn't call you. I'm glad you've come to visit, though, she said. But I heard you. In the forest. You were calling my name. She rose from her chair and knelt in front of me. When did you hear me calling you? She asked. I told her it was just a moment ago. Her face changed in that moment. She grabbed my shoulders and said, That wasn't me you heard, and you stay well away from that forest. You never go in there again. If you want to come to my house, you call me and I'll come get you. And I listened to my grandma. I stayed far away from the wood. Years passed without incident, and my grandma kept her promise. If I wanted to visit, I called her up and she came to get me. I was at her house one day. I was 14 or 15 years old at the time. I was harvesting and pressing native plants for a school biology project. There were a several species of wildflowers that grew on my grandma's land that I wanted to get samples from. Still, I made sure not to cross the threshold into the forest. I was close to the edge of the woods, but still in plain sight of the house. My grandma was rolling out a pie crust in the kitchen last I saw. She most likely was watching me out the kitchen window. I didn't feel unsafe out there. That is, until I heard my name being called from inside the forest. I ran back to the house and my grandma knew by the look on my face what I was about to say. It called my name again. I asked my grandma what it was. I could tell she didn't want to talk about it, but at this point I needed to know. She didn't divulge much, but she did tell me it was some sort of creature. She said it looks like a ghoul and they live all over the place. Usually rural, wilderness places. Sometimes forests, sometimes caves. They can mimic sounds they've heard. Animal sounds and sometimes voices, but they can't talk. They can only repeat things like a parrot. I asked if it was dangerous and my grandma only said that nothing kind would try to lure you into the forest using the voice of someone you trust. And that was the last we ever spoke of it. I continued to visit my grandma, but I never ventured too far from the house. I never heard about the creature again, and I'm thankful I never saw it. Though sometimes I wonder what it looked like. I was so relieved when my grandma moved into an apartment in town. I sometimes still have questions when I think back to the creature in the forest. I wish I had asked her if she ever saw it herself or if it had a name. How many of them are around, and why don't people talk about them? But she's much older now, and I don't want to bring those memories back to the surface. When you think of Michigan, you probably think of the Great Lakes, or at least I do. And naturally, when you think of the Great Lakes, you've probably heard about how dangerous they can be and the possible creatures that lurk beneath the surface. But what if I told you Michigan is home to something far more wicked, something that lurks on the land, in the forests? Yeah. Honestly, I wouldn't have believed it either. That was until I saw it with my own eyes. My house was sort of the party house in high school. Nothing too crazy, really, but definitely the home that all my friends would flock to during school breaks, where we could have bonfires, drink, and smoke in peace. Usually bonfires were reserved for the spring or fall, given how hot the nights were in the summer. But I remember this particular summer night a cold front had come in off the lakes, and the air was just cool enough that we felt inclined to gather up wood and start a fire. Our property was surrounded by woods, so me and my four friends had all spread out in different areas, doing our best to find branches that weren't wet and would easily spark. I was hacking into a dead tree when I suddenly heard a blood-curdling scream. My body ran cold, and without hesitation I sprinted out of the woods into the backyard to see what was going on. As all of my other friends followed quickly behind, Kevin emerged looking particularly distraught 
and out of breath. He rushed us into the house, and between gasps of air swore to us he had seen something in the woods. He exclaimed that he couldn't make out what it was in the distance, but it was massive in size, black, and maneuvering on its legs almost like some sort of gorilla. Now, I don't know about there being gorillas in Michigan, but I do know there are black bears. And even though Kevin swore that's not what this was, I countered that perhaps it was reaching up against a tree, so it looked taller and as though it were standing on two legs. After some heavy convincing, Kevin seemed to relinquish to the idea that he truly did just see a bear, and we all brought out attention back to the bonfire. A few hours had passed at this point, and the sun was already setting. We pulled the pit away from the woods and closer to the house to further alleviate any weariness, and in no time the sky fell dark and the stars came out. We sat around the bonfire for quite some time, reminiscing on the middle school days when the five of us had become friends. Eventually we pulled out hot dogs, sausages, and s'mores ingredients, and once all of us were fat and happy, the alcohol made its appearance. We started with shots and eventually switched over to mixed drinks, but truth be told, we all had far more than what we really should have. But we were high school boys. What did we know about moderation? Eventually, Jimmy recommended we play a game of what are the chances, and so commenced the night full of fun. It started with harmless pranks like calling an ex-girlfriend, taking a body shot, jumping into the pool naked. But eventually, it came time for Kevin's turn. As the story would go, Jimmy dared Kevin to go back into the woods by himself and face whatever creature it was he saw that day. It was clear to me Kevin was uncomfortable, and it made me upset knowing the other boys would rag on him if this dare went unanswered. So in an attempt to be the heroic friend, which really just meant the alcohol was glorifying my bravery, I volunteered to take Kevin's place. And without a second thought, I marched into the woods destined to prove to the guys that I was the manliest of them all. I trekked deep into the forest, and at some point along the way, I had the brilliant idea that I would hide behind a tree until the guys came looking for me, at which point I would give them a real scare. But in my drunken haze, minutes turned into what felt like hours before I heard any sign of life. The rustling, which I thought was coming from my friends, prompted me to peek out from behind my hiding place. And just as I did, my body froze, nowhere near prepared for what I saw next. Nearly eight feet tall, teeth snarled and sharp as razors and piercing eyes. But the thing that really made my skin curl was that this creature seemed to have the body of a man and the face of a dog. The head was covered in a mane of black fur with a protruding snout, while the rest of his figure seemed almost human-like, wide shoulders, chiseled muscles, and human legs. I went to scream, but it was as though my voice was stuck in my throat. Honest to God, I think that's what saved me that night because this thing was not looking in my direction, and had I made any noise, it certainly would have been. My saving grace was that I was probably thirty feet away from this creature, and the crunching of leaves as it brooded through the woods, well as its guttural growling, shadowed my labored breathing. As the creature made its way in the opposite direction of my hiding spot, I prayed in a way I had never done before. When the sound of its footsteps trailed off into the distance, I waited maybe a minute more before sprinting as fast as I could back to the safety of my backyard. When I came barreling out of the woods, I finally started yelling to my friends, whose faces instantly went from laughing to concerned. I rushed everyone inside, recounted the creature as best I could, and in an instant, we were all sobered up. The police were contacted and by morning an investigation went underway for a man with a dog mask lurking in the woods. A couple of years ago, I got the chance to do a few days of house sitting for a friend in northwestern Washington outside Lake Stevens. I'd always dreamed about living out in the country, even though I'd never spent much time out there, so I jumped at the chance. Amy's place wasn't big, but it sat on a nice wooded property. It was a really rural dirt road and everything. I think it had been her grandparents' place and she'd inherited it. Anyway, she gave me the run of the place and said I could do what I wanted, but I should be inside by dark. 
I remember thinking that was a weird thing to say. I mean, I was in my 20s. I wasn't a kid with a curfew. But hey, Amy was paying me to have a weekend in the country, so I decided not to argue. Anyway, I found the little dirt driveway just fine and got there with plenty of time for my friend to head to the airport. I spent the day getting to know her two old dogs, got myself settled, and was tired enough from the drive to go to bed early. As far as house sitting gigs go, this was easy. It felt like a little vacation, like I was getting paid to hang out in a little house in the woods and live out my homesteading fantasies without actually having to commit to buying a house. It was great. The only thing that was weird about it was how dark it got at night. I've lived in Seattle all my life, so I wasn't prepared for just how dark it got when the sun finally went down out here. It was dark and quiet. The house was far enough off the main road that I couldn't even hear the occasional passing car. About the only thing I did hear at night was rustling from the woods. There had to be animals out there. Deer, or maybe even a bobcat. I wasn't worried, though. The dogs and I were good. The night before Amy was coming home, I decided to go check the garden for salad fixings. It was a nice big plot with a fence around it to discourage rabbits or deer. I don't garden, but Amy had told me that all I had to do was water it and it'd take care of itself. When I got into the garden, I noticed that it looked like something had been eating some of the plants. Deer, probably, or rabbits. I looked around the fence line and didn't see any holes, but there was a section that was folded down, like something had stepped on it. There was an old shed on the property that was where Amy kept her gardening stuff. The door was hard to open. That thing was old. But I did find some stakes I could use to prop up the sagging fence, so I grabbed them. The shed was literally set into the tree line, so I had to get right up to the woods to get into it. It was closer to the trees than I'd been the whole time I'd been there, and I remember the temperature really dropped that close to the trees. It felt weird, too, like something was watching me. I told myself that I was just being silly, but I also didn't stick around. I just grabbed what I needed and headed back to the garden plot. I did a decent patch job on the fence by tying the fence mesh to the stake. When I was done, I noticed that a few tomatoes had fallen off the vine. They weren't even bruised, but they were still green. I decided to stick them on the windowsill so they could finish ripening. I picked some ripe tomatoes, a couple radishes and some lettuce leaves, and took them into the house to make my salad and grill a burger. The dogs and I had a nice quiet dinner. They woke up enough to stagger over to their food bowls and then watch me eat my burger and salad. Turns out I'm not immune to big sad puppy eyes, and I ended up giving them part of my burger. In the middle of the night I heard rustling again. I woke up enough to listen, and it sounded far enough away that I decided not to worry about it. But then I heard a snapping sound a lot closer. The dogs perked up too. Now here's where it gets weird, because those dogs, they were old and sweet, and they'd spent most of the day sleeping in the nearest warm sunbeam like pit bull-shaped pillows. Right now they were perked up, looking out the door toward the kitchen. They didn't move. They just looked. I heard rustling around again like something was walking around. I figured it was that deer that had broken down the fence and that the garden was once again in mortal danger. I slid out of bed, grabbed my mag light from the bedside table, and tiptoed my way down the hall. The kitchen looked out over the garden, so my plan was to shine the flashlight out the window and hopefully scare the deer away. The tree line was a good distance away, but I couldn't see much in the way of detail that far out in the yard, just spiky shapes. What I did see was something moving around in the garden. I flicked on the mag light and aimed it out at the yard. At first, I didn't see anything, but I swept the light across the yard, and then I saw something I never want to see again. It looked like a hairy, reddish-brown lump, but it definitely wasn't a deer. It was too big. I thought maybe it was a bear because it stood up on its hind legs. Then it turned around and I got a look, and it was no bear. The thing had this weirdly shaped head like a gorilla, and no hair on its face like a gorilla. But there was no way there could be a gorilla loose in the woods of northern Washington. It was huge, too, taller than the six-foot stake I'd put into the ground to fix the fence earlier and built like a linebacker. 
Whatever it was, it did not like the light because it wrinkled its face into a snarl and let out this growl that sounded like four angry Rottweilers all at once. I panicked. I dropped the flashlight and tried to back up, but I was shaking so hard that I went to my knees. I heard stomping across the 